Uh, today is uh, the day we're going to be talking about reactive transport modeling. So um, I've been looking forward to this day. Hopefully, hopefully you all have as well. This is the schedule for today. I'm going to kick it off with a, an introductory presentation. Um, and then we have a tutorial session that will be led by Ku Wei Chen. Um, and Hyun will give us another presentation later this morning on machine learning and artificial intelligence methods for metabolic modeling in reactive transport models. Um, we have a little bit of a longer lunch break today uh, because we have a Zoom conflict. And so we'll be breaking for a little over an hour and then we'll come back in the afternoon with presentations by the group from Subsurface Insights, uh, Roloff Verstig and Rebecca Rubenstein showing, talking about some of the methods they have for uh, incorporating microbial models into reactor transport. And then we'll have Michelle Newcomer giving a presentation on using some R tools for um, gathering and managing hydrologic data from the internet. So we're looking forward to a, a, a fun day with you. And um, again, please join us over on uh, Discord for some chat and interaction. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and start up my presentation. So this morning, I'm going to be talking about incorporating microbial processes in reactive transport models. And so to, um, to just give us a little bit of a recap of where we've been this week and where we're going, um, this is a slide we presented uh, early on in the course that gives an overview of the various elements of this course. And so you'll recall that on Monday, we spent a lot of time talking about metagenomes, uh, metagenome assembly and binning and DRAM. Um, and so we were kind of up in this area of the plot and uh, using some data from the Wonders Consortium, the uh, worldwide consortium for collecting river from dynamic river systems. And then on Tuesday, uh, we went into the other side of the wonders data, which is a lot about organic matter characterization using FTICR mass spectrometry and other methods and analyses of those data and visualization of the results. And so we talked about a variety of tools down in this area. We also talked about um, how to use those data to derive models using lambda theory for reaction kinetics and, um, and stoichiometry. On Wednesday, uh, yesterday, we really went into the deep uh, end of metabolic modeling and how we use both metagenomic information as well as metabolomic information to construct reaction networks, describing the functionality of individual organisms, uh, bins of organisms, or entire uh, communities of organisms and how to build those networks, um, incorporate metabolo metabolite information, and gap fill those networks. Today, what we're going to talk about is over here in this part of the diagram, where we take that information and actually begin to incorporate it into models that link hydrology, chemistry, and biology. Um, and that takes us a step towards being able to apply these methods to understand and solve um, ecosystem scale problems. So I'm going to start by just addressing the question for those of you who may not be familiar at all with reactive transport models. What is a reactive transport model? And I'll, I'll give you a brief history of how microbial processes have been incorporated into subsurface reactive transport models over the years with some examples. And then I'll give you a description of early efforts that were made to link genome scale models with reactive transport models. And then finally conclude with current research and development areas on incorporating um, recent omics advances into RTMs. And a lot of this material is based on a recent paper that was published in the journal Elements by myself and Christoph Myla. Christoph is one of our um, instructors in the school and he'll be presenting tomorrow morning. And um, I put a link to this paper over on the Discord site under the Reactive Transport Modeling channel. Um, definitely encourage you to take a look and check that paper out. It should be fairly accessible, um, written in the style for the Elements uh, Journal. So what is a reactive transport model? Well, um, this is actually the title of a paper by Carl Stiefel and others from 2005, which is a great reference if you want to learn about uh, re re uh, reactive transport modeling and particularly how it can be used in research environments. And um, what they called reactive transport models are 
a, an essential tool and a new research approach for the earth sciences. And here's a link to that paper if you'd like to check that one out. Um, basically, this, this, di this diagram is from that paper. And what they point out is that a reactive transport model couples representations, mathematical representations of hydrologic, chemical, and bio biological processes. Recent reactive transport models, or RTMs, are designed to quantitatively describe and predict the distribution of chemicals in time and space. And most RTMs um, have been traditionally applied in the subsurface environment, but certainly they can also be applied in rivers, uh, in surface water bodies, in the atmosphere, and so forth. And so usually these chemical constituents are represented as being dissolved in water or some other fluid solvent. It could be air, it could be um, oil or gas, or maybe supercritical carbon dioxide. So they're solutes dissolved in a, in a liquid phase or in a solid phase. They could be mineral phases or they could be solutes sorbed to mineral surfaces, for example. And so when we talk about reactive transport, if we think about the two components of that, transport refers to the movement of these chemical substances through space, usually driven by the flow of the water or the other whatever fluid solvent they're dissolved in. And then the reactive part refers to chemical transformations that occur. And those occur through interactions with other solutes that might be in the system, as well as with mineral surfaces. And importantly for this particular uh, summer school, interactions with biological agents. And so particularly uh, bacteria, but also of course, uh, other, other microbes, fungi and so forth. So here we have this diagram that uh, from, from Carl Stiefel's paper showing an example of a system that could be modeled by reactive transport models. So here we have leachate coming out of a landfill. Uh, this would be probably rich with organic matter. And so it would undergo uh, decomposition by microorganisms and there would typically be set up this sequence of, of redox conditions. Um, spanning from very close to the landfill where all of the other electron donors have been depleted, you now have methanogenesis happening. And as you get a little farther away, you move into a sulfate reduction, iron reduction, denitrification, and ultimately far enough away where oxygen is still available, you could have aerobic respiration. Now, if we think about iron reduction zone and we zoom in on that zone, you might see, for example, microbes forming biofilms on the surface of mineral grains containing iron oxides. And as they're working to reduce those iron oxides to gain energy, they're releasing iron, dissolved iron into the aqueous phase. Uh, they're also generating um, bicarbonate and other uh, effects on pH and the bicarbonate might then subsequently form carbonate minerals, including iron carbonates or calcium carbonate, calcite. As those minerals and biofilms grow, they in turn can change the properties of the porous medium such that you actually have a feedback onto the hydrology. So you might change, for example, the porosity or permeability of the medium and change the flow patterns. And so these coupling amongst these processes is very challenging to understand. And this is where reactive transport models can be very helpful to us in elucidating these complex interactions. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about transport first. What is underlying the processes of transport in a reactive transport model? Well, really, in most reactive transport models, there are three primary ways that things get transported in the system. Um, the first is by what we call advection, which is simply movement that's driven by the flow of the solvent fluid. So if we look at this example of a pore scale medium, um, think of these whitish zones as being your solid soil grains, maybe sand grains. Um, and in between them are pore spaces that water is flowing. And the blue dots here and the blue and green dots represent solute molecules dissolved in that water. So as we go forward in this simulation, what we see is these materials being advected through the porous medium, moving with the water flow, being carried as, as basically passive tracers in this particular example. And one thing we do see is that the advection process is spatially variable. So some areas where they're colored in green have higher velocities, some areas where they're colored in blue have lower velocities. And that leads to some important um, phenomena at the larger scale. In addition to advection, we can also have 
diffusion, molecular scale diffusion, which is movement or spreading of solutes that are driven by local gradients and solute concentration. So where the concentration is high, it's those solutes are going to tend to diffuse towards areas where the concentration is low. And typically that can be represented using fixed law, which represents the rate of diffusion as a function of the, gra of the concentration gradient. Now dispersion is the third aspect that's often in our models, but dispersion is a little bit of a um, perhaps non-physical parameter because what dispersion really represents is movement or spreading, apparent spreading of solutes that's driven by variations in advection or advective velocity that are smaller than the scales that we're resolving in our model. So in this case, if you think of this entire cube as maybe being one grid cell of our reactive transport model, where we're simulating things at a larger scale, we're not actually capturing all these advective variations. And so at the larger scale, what that looks like is it's spreading things out much like a diffusion process. And so in many reactive transport models, dispersion is also represented as a diffusion-like process using fixed law. Although we've learned um, that in fact, this kind of uh, advective dominated dispersion in many cases is not well represented by fixed law. And what's often called in the literature anomalous dispersion is actually not anomalous at all, it's, it's the norm. So you may see some other models put forward that represent this dispersion in different ways than uh, as a diffusion-like process. But most reactive transport models will represent this process, these processes um, using these three kind of representations. And most often, diffusion is considered to be, molecular scale diffusion is considered to be small relative to physical or hydrodynamic dispersion. And so they're lumped together into a single term. Another example that kind of shows us how these things work together is this simulation where the black uh, circles represent the solid grains and the red spaces represent the pore space. And we've injected in this system a little bit of solute into this blue zone. And as I move it forward in time, what you'll see is here we're going to allow diffusion to occur locally into the solid grains. And so in this simulation, now you see the diffusion is occurring within into the grains as the constant where the concentrations are high. And then once that solute pulse is passed, those can diffuse back out into the pore space, creating a very long tail um, on our breakthrough curve. And so these are the kinds of ways that advection, diffusion, and dispersion interact to move substances around in the uh, in the porous media environment. Now, if we look at a reactive transport model, a typical model would be formulated looking something like this, where this term represents dispersion, which includes the effects of both molecular diffusion and uh, physical or uh, hydrodynamic dispersion. And, and that's incorporated into this dispersivity parameter or dispersion coefficient. Um, C in this equation is the concentration of the solutes. Phi is the porosity of the porous medium. And then this term represents the advection, which is uh, the movement with the velocity of the fluid flow, where U represents the velocity vector at the local point in space and time. And the way we generally then incorporate reactions into the advection dispersion equation is by adding a reaction term. And it's really this reaction term that we want to talk about a lot today. How do we, met, how do we represent that reaction term when we combine reactions with transport. So in particular, we're interested here in how do we incorporate microbial reactions. Now there are many different kinds of reactions that can occur in environmental systems. And some of those are abiotic reactions, for example, uh, interaction of solutes with mineral surfaces, sorption, desorption, surface complexation reactions. You can also have aqueous speciation reactions. Um, where the, the uh, various molecules are interacting in a, a abiotic context. But we also have microbes in our systems and those microbes can gain energy by catalyzing reactions to move things uh, to closer towards equilibrium conditions. And they do that by breaking down or building complex molecules. And in so doing, they couple a variety of elemental cycles, including carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, iron, and many others. And by transferring these elements back and forth between or among various phases, solid, liquid, solute, and gaseous phases, they affect their physical transport and, uh, and then therefore their spatial distribution.
So as I think about how to incorporate microbial reactions, this table, which is from my paper with Christophe that I mentioned early on, um, we kind of described a series of ways that people have represented microbes in reactive transport models, starting with earlier representations of microbes as catalysts, then microbes as reactants, and more recently, microbes as active biological agents with some regulatory features. Um, I'm not going to address the functional and trait-based model aspects here because uh, Owen has already addressed that very nicely on his talk on Monday. But I'm going to talk a little bit about these first three and kind of walk you through with some examples. And the main example I'm going to use in a lot of these is the uh, Rifle Colorado uranium bioremediation site. You may have heard of the Rifle site. Uh, this is a picture of the Rifle site and it is located in uh, western Colorado along the Colorado River in the floodplain here. This is a former uranium mill tellings site and so there was uh, a uranium mines and where they milled the uranium and put the tailings from the milling process out into the environment. Then the uranium subsequently leached and con contaminated this aquifer. And so there have been a lot of studies here sponsored by the Department of Energy to look at how, bio how bi microbes can be used to um, help modify the movement of the uranium so that it doesn't go to the river. And so what you see down here is this little shed, and I'm going to zoom in on that shed. And what you see is an injection gallery of wells where um, the researchers here inject substances, in particular an electron donor, usually acetate, to stimulate microbial growth and activity. And then those microbes, when they're doing their thing, reduce uranium, which changes it from a relatively soluble oxidized state to a relatively insoluble mineral phase that it exists in the reduced state. Um, there are many other reactions, of course, that happen in this context. And so we can have the entire redox ladder from aerobic respiration through denitrification, um, uh, iron reduction, sulfate reduction, um, ultimately all the way down to uh, various other reactions that occur in the process. Very often, uranium is also reduced, as I mentioned. So these are some of the processes that need to be incorporated into our reactive transport model. So the first um, step of incorporating microbes was early on was using treating microbes as catalysts for these reactions. And so an example of that is a paper by Wong, Wong and Van Capellen from 1996, where they studied marine sediments. And they observed that there is a, a typical profile of various electron acceptors in this system. So oxygen, you would see very high at the surface of the sediment column, the interface with the water body. And then you'd see that depleted quickly. And nitrate also depleted fairly quickly. And then the buildup of reduced iron and manganese as these processes proceeded. And so they represented this interactive transport model as kind of indicated schematically here, where each of these uh, processes was linked to the mineralization of organic matter, um, basically the, the oxidation of organic matter to carbon dioxide by microorganisms. However, in their model, they didn't explicitly represent the organisms. They represented the re equations that they or the, the uh, reactions that they could catalyze by the various re reactions in the model. But that assumes then that the biomass itself is in some sort of quasi-equilibrium. So there's no real growth or change in the volume of biomass in the system. And that the system is then constrained by the concentrations of the electron donor and acceptor themselves, and not by the composition or amount of biomass. Another example from the rifle site, and actually most of the rifle models do consider biomass explicitly, but I found one small example here from a paper by Elin Fong et al, where basically they looked at the reduction of iron uh, in phyllosilicates and clay minerals in the top equation, this is the stoichiometry, and in the bottom equation in iron oxides by iron reducing microbes. And what you see in these equations is that there is no biomass term. So the conversion of iron three to iron two um, by micro, microbial iron reduction is represented using the stoichiometry, but the biomass is not explicitly represented here. And what they, they did acknowledge in their paper that this was a, a, an important consideration and that would be included as new information uh, became available in the system. Now, as we move forward in time, 
people began to recognize, including the, the, the rifle team, that the biomass itself was an important uh, product and reactant in the system. And so now you can see that many of the models used at rifle, example from Yabusaki et al. in, in the Journal of Contaminant Hydrology in 2007, you see now that this term appears in the stoichiometry, where the biomass of the iron reducers is explicitly represented in the stoichiometry, and the amount of biomass affects the rate of microbial iron reduction in the, in the reaction term. And so this stoichiometry again represents the reduction of iron oxides to uh, reduced iron 2, solute dissolved, and also now has this biomass term. And this is one of many terminal electron acceptors considered in this process. So when you look at the kinetics of the reaction in this model, you see that there are um, a number here, this N, number of electron acceptors, NEA, and those could vary from uh, oxygen, nitrate, iron, sulfate, that right down the ladder. Um, and as each of those is sequentially consumed, this indicator variable chi is changed from zero to one. So initially it would be one for oxygen, and then as oxygen is depleted, it would go to zero and it would become one for nitrate and so forth. And so the way that these are often represented kinetically is in terms of a dual monode model where the, the rate of the biological process depends on the concentration of the electron um, donor and the concentration of the terminal electron accept acceptor parameterized by these half saturation constants. And the biomass yield in this model is based on an energetics representation from Rittman and McCarty. And the biomass itself is assumed to have a molecular formula shown here, five carbons, seven hydrogens, two oxygens, and one nitrogen. And so that allows you stoichiometrically to balance your equations and um, uh, represent the biomass in the system. And an example here is shown where they injected acetate into the system, mo um, monitored it at a number of monitoring wells shown in the various colored symbols, and then simulated it in the model with this dark blue curve. And you can see they injected acetate over a period of 123 days. That was the biostimulation period, and then monitored what happened in this system. And so if we look at the model results and compare them with the observations from Steve Yabusaki's paper, you can see here's a, a map of the injection gallery that I showed you in that one uh, uh, photo with the, with the shed. And then you can see there are three uh, rows of monitoring wells down gradient as the groundwater is flowing this direction. And so um, if we look at the results, we can um, compare results in each of these three rows of wells with the data being the uh, the symbols and lines and the model being the solid dark blue curve. And you can see that their model was able to quite well represent uh, the movement of, in this case, a conservative tracer, bromide, and in this case, the electron donor that was injected, acetate. And here, the concentrations of sulfate as sulfate reduction occurred. And, and also associated with iron and sulfate reduction, the reduction of uranium and removal from solution into the mineral phase. Now the next step from this in this process, again, we started with microbes as passive catalysts, not explicitly represented. Then we moved to microbes as actual reactants where they're involved directly in the stoichiometry and, and the reaction kinetics. Now we can consider the fact that in fact, though, microbes are not simply another chemical constituent, they're actually self-regulating agents that can respond to their environment and regulate their chemical pathways depending on what their environment is. And this part of the story begins with um, a person named Derek Lovely, a professor at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, who um, him and his team discovered an organism called Geobacter metalloreducens. And this was back in the late 1980s. Um, this organism was first isolated, I think, from sediments in the Potomac River and was the first organism that was shown to respire carbon using um, metal, iron oxides, as terminal electron acceptors. And so it's interesting to me that, you know, really um, only about 30 or so years ago, this idea of microbial iron reduction and respiration of something other than oxygen was, was a very novel concept. They also discovered another related strain called geobacter sulfur reducens. And um, in terms of geobacter sulfur reducens, 
Derek worked with Krishna Mahadevan to develop and curate by hand a very detailed genome scale model of this organism. So they, they mapped out its genome, they annotated that genome, identified proteins and their function, and developed a reaction network representing this. Now, at the time, Phil Long, who worked at PNL as a research scientist, was the PI of the Rifle Project, and Derek and his team were working on the Rifle Project because it turned out that Geobacter uh, metalloreducins and sulfurreducins were very important, were the dominant organisms at the rifle site responding to acetate injection and performing metal reduction. And so um, Phil uh, saw this model that was developed by Derek and Krishna, they called their in silico genome scale model, and was intrigued by it and talked to me and said, we need to go talk to these guys. So we went and met with them in Massachusetts, and we developed a proposal to incorporate these new models into reactive transport simulations. And so this was um, this was really exciting. This led to the engagement with Yilin. Yilin was, um, and these are old pictures from back in that time. So uh, Yilin at the time was, uh, as you've already seen, very engaged in the uh, research um, and the reactive transport modeling that was being done at Rifle. And so she was the one who implemented the genome scale model into the reactive transport models at Rifle, leading to a paper that we published in, in 2009 in Microbial Biotechnology, which was the first really to incorporate uh, genome scale representation of microbial function into our reactive transport model. And we did that using constraint-based modeling based on uh, what Hyun referred to as dynamic FBA, flux balance analysis yesterday. And in that, basically, we do a genome scale characterization of the reaction pathways based on um, genomics, um, uh, se genomic sequencing and annotation to identify the metabolic network. And that metabolic network can then be represented as a stoichiometric uh, matrix, which in turn can be subjected to flux constraints. In our case, we used flux constraints based on uptake of three key constituents, acetate, iron, and uh, ammonium. And so these were measured in the laboratory and fitted to michaelis menten type of models. And then those flux constraints were used to solve the dynamic uh, flux balance analysis, depending on the local concentration of acetate, iron, and ammonium in, using um, dynamic programming methods. And so the, uh, uh, the objective function used for those linear programming methods was optimization of biomass growth under the given conditions. And the way we coupled that to our reactive transport model was in this way. So if you consider a, a, a reactive transport model simulating flow and transport, it has a number of different grid cells. And at each time step in each grid cell, we know the concentration of these key electron donors, acceptors, and nutrients, um, respectively, acetate, iron, and, and uh, nitrogen from ammonium. And so we would pass those as flux constraints to the genome scale model, solve the optimization problem to get the reaction fluxes, which then replace the reaction rates we would formally have used from our dual monode kinetic model by the ones calculated directly from the genome scale model. And we use those rates to perform the next time step of simulation in the transport model and then do the whole thing all over again. Now you can imagine that if you have a large complex transport model with many time steps, you're, you're going through this process and running this in silico model many, many times if you did a direct coupling. And so the way we actually did that is we pre-computed a lookup table for a range of concentrations of acetate, iron, and ammonium. And then at each time step in the reactive transport model, we simply looked up a value that was close to the concentrations observed in that grid cell and used those rates from that lookup table. <clears throat> um, and I think uh, you'll hear Hyun talk a little bit more about some advances of how we might do that better in, um, currently. So the, if we think about the, observ the outputs of that model and compare it with the previous model by Yabusaki et al., what we can see is that the genome scale model link is the dashed line and the, um, the model by Yabusaki et al. using the traditional monokinetic was uh, the dark line. And what you see is both models perform pretty similarly in terms of representing the field observations. But the difference is, of course, now that the, the microbial uh, reactive transport model based on the genome scale model actually has few, if any, uh, tunable parameters. All of the parameters of the model are directly determined by 
the genome scale characterization of the metabolism of that system and optimization under the certain flux constraints of the, uh, that are imposed. And so this is really nice in that this has moved us towards potentially a more um, uh, predictive and less fitted sort of system. Now, a, a really interesting work that followed up, uh, Yulin and uh, Steve and Mike Wilkins and some other folks did some really interesting work by testing this model at RIFLE against some other omics. These are observed indicators of gene expression, um, proteomics, basically measuring the proteins that are observed, which indicates which pathways are actually being expressed in the field by the microorganisms. And this graph over here from their paper shows how they compared the proteomics data, which are the blue bars, with the in silico model predictions under either limiting uh, ammonium or excess ammonium conditions. And what you can see is that there's actually a lot of correspondence between the predicted pathways that were supposed to be active according to the genome scale model and the proteins that were expressed representing the activity of those pathways. And so they concluded in their paper that the most abundant proteins consistently match the highest metabolic reaction flux as predicted by the genome scale model, which was encouraging. However, you can see there are also some differences here, and most of those differences were associated with nitrogen processes, nitrogen utilization and fixation. And um, strangely enough, uh, the, the microorganisms out in the field were actually performing nitrogen fixation, which is a metabolically expensive process, even though there was abundant ammonium available at least apparently. And so they used this information to alter the parameters of the in silico model to basically move it towards nitrogen fixation. But one of the interesting things is that given that the uh, bulk observations of ammonium in the system, the activity of nitrogen fixing pathways would not have been anticipated. We would have assumed that they would just use ammonium rather than fixing nitrogen um, themselves. And so without yes, having seen these proteins, uh, we would not have, um, was that my warning, Becky? It's nine o'clock. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Okay, I'm just about getting to the end here. So this, these things indicated a, a key challenge in applying these models, and that's the challenge of scale. And there's two really indications here of scale issues or scale dependencies. And the first is that in our original paper in 2009, we actually had to modify the flux constraints by a factor of 10 in order to match the observed data. And that was because the predicted rates from the genome scale model were higher than what we were actually observing in the field. Okay, so although I said there was, you know, that the parameters were specified, in fact, we did have to tune this one parameter in order to fix it. Now, the, the second indication is that the proteomics indicated that nitrogen fixation was significant, even when bulk ammonium was apparently not limiting in the field. So this leads us to believe that there are some issues that relate to fundamental processes of diffusion and mixing at the smallest scales. If you think about microorganisms sitting on the surface of a soil grain, perhaps reducing iron, using acetate from the aqueous phase, what's going to happen is they're going to deplete that acetate locally, leading to a gradient in acetate from the center of the pore towards the grain surfaces. And in other words, the bulk concentration of acetate that we measure in the field or that we predict with our coarsely gridded model is much larger than the actual acetate concentration that the organisms are feeling or observing at the surface of the grain. And so the ver what they're responding to in terms of their flux constraints is lower than what, the, what we think they should be responding to. And so therefore, they're generally their um, uh, metabolic rates are going to be lower than we predict if we use the bulk concentrations in our predictive model. And the same is true with the nitrogen fixation. We could actually have ammonium depletion in areas where if we took a measurement from a well, we would see ammonium in the water, but the microbes themselves may not be feeling that ammonium or observing that ammonium, and therefore they're turning to nitrogen fixation. 
And so to look at this scale dependency, we did a numerical experiment using poor scale simulation. And this is work by Gazelle Tartakovsky et al. published in 2013. What we did was we did the same process I showed earlier, but instead of the large scale reactive transport model, we had a poor scale flow and reactive transport model. And this was implemented using a method called smooth particle hydrodynamics, where the fluid flow is represented using particles. And so now for each particle, we have a set of concentrations of substrates that impose flux constraints, solve our model, get reaction fluxes and rates, and iterate on this process, again, using a lookup table approach. The results of this numerical experiment are shown here. Um, we have two cases, a case shown in the first column with no flow, so diffusion only, and a second case where we impose flow from the top to the bottom and we inject acetate at the top. And what we did was we simulated the biomass growth here shown in red, using the by the reduction of iron, these green uh, surfaces on the white grains. And this is coupled to the oxidation of acetate, which is the green solute in the pore spaces. And what you see in the case of diffusion only is that um, the acetate is being reduced preferentially in some areas. And in these areas, there is actually a lot of more smaller grains and therefore more surface area. So that rate is larger there. And so now these zones have less uh, acetate than the larger scale zones. And so if you look at the overall rate, if you would have predicted the overall rate from the average concentration, it's going to be um, lower in the actual system than it would be if we predicted it from the average concentration of the bulk system. And the same was true in the flow system where we had an average uh, concentration in bulk that was higher than the concentration being observed by the microbes at the grain surfaces. So my final slide here is that the future of microbial uh, reactive transport models, and that's what we think, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about this week or moving towards this week. In 2009, we were limited to studying one model organism, Geobacter sulfuridusins, and that model organism's metabolism was coupled to a reactive transport model through a pre-computed lookup table. Um, when we thought about trying to incorporate complex microbial communities, this approach was really just not feasible. And of course, at the time, we really weren't able to um, develop microbial reaction networks for more than a few uh, detailed organisms because they were generally hand, uh, hand curated. Now, as we move to current day, 2020, we now have metagenomics and we can use those metagenomics as we've seen on uh, days one, two, and three to develop genome scale reaction networks that represent the interactions of complex microbial communities. And as Hen will talk about later in his talk today, we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning approaches to replace the lookup table to couple microbial metabolism and reactive transport models in a more efficient way. We can begin to integrate multiple omics data types, including metagenomics, metabolomics, proteomics into our models. And we incorporate these into community modeling frameworks as shown here in this schematic diagram, again, from my paper with Christoph, where we use these omics data to inform uh, genome and metabolic informed network models, set up reactive transport models, and perform parameter optimization by comparing with observed data using tools like, for example, um, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, MCMC. And that process can iterate um, and then thereby improving our models over time. So I appreciate your attention here, and I hope there are some questions and discussion. I really look forward to having these basic concepts expanded on by our, our speakers throughout the course of the rest of the day. Thanks, Tim. That was really great. I mean, that was such a nice uh, walk through like the past 15 years on where we started, where we are now, and um, some of these accomplishments are, are still being forged in this, this summer school is really kind of um, introducing a whole another uh, generation of scientists to move this forward. So that's really exciting. Well, I think that's why this school is particularly exciting to me is that I'm seeing some of the ideas that, you know, we developed early on, um, but we really couldn't do a lot with at the time. Right. Um, but now they're coming to fruition because of the work of this community that is really enabling these things to become much more um, accessible and usable. So it is it's really super exciting to me. It is. It is. 
So there are a couple of questions, both in the, the chat and on um, Discord. And I think we have a few minutes uh, to answer them. So if you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so there's one question here from uh, Rhea Braun. Uh, what about microbial chemotaxis? Ah, yes, that's a great question. <laughs> I love that question. So Rhea, you're totally right. Um, most of these models um, have treated the microbes as being a stationary attached phase. And so definitely when they're doing iron reduction, they are typically attached to the grain surface where the iron oxide minerals are. However, we have observed in the rifle site that during active biostimulation, there's a huge flush of aqueous um, phase bacteria, suspended bacteria or pelagic bacteria. And in fact, um, under those conditions, the geobacter do express flagella and they start swimming around. And we believe that they are chemotactic. So they do follow gradients in iron concentrations in the solute. Kind of think about it as like, well, I've used up my iron oxides locally, so I'm gonna jump off, start swimming. Where am I gonna go? I'm gonna go where there's a bunch of other things going on, a bunch of other iron reduction happening, and that's going to probably be where there's a lot of iron too in the water. So they're chemotactic to the iron too. We have um, done some work. Um, I think probably Rishi Parashar is on this call. He might be on today. I know he's been on this week. He's done some really interesting work in this area. Um, as well as other people. And so we've started to look at detailed models of microbial chemotaxis and microbial movement, including some studies, recent studies at EMSL. Um, this past year, we had a postdoc come up and do some studies with microfluidics models looking at um, chemotactic bacteria. And so I can post a, a paper publication um, that we came up with on that recently. So yeah, that's a great question. Very exciting. It's an area I think there's opportunity for definite improvement of these models by incorporating bacterial movements. Here's another question um, from Britt uh, Amerson. Uh, how many different microbes are you currently able to include in your active transport models? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, back in 2009, we were happy if we could include two or three. Um, <laughs> and of course, now with the metagenomics approach, we can really include everybody who's there. And it really depends on how you want to bend that. So we can treat the community as sort of a super organism where we ignore the fact that there are cellular boundaries. And we look at the genomic potential of the entire community and represent that as if it were a single organism. And so that's one approach. But as, as Hyun, I think, um, has shown in some of his work, you can also then break that into compartmentalized systems. And those might represent, for example, your bins of your metagenomic system where you bend them into different functional groups and now you can represent each of those functional groups as kind of an organism per se. So generally speaking we're not going to explicitly represent say a thousand organisms in a community or a million organisms but we are going to bend them in some way and it's really looking at how to appropriately bend them that I think is one of the cutting edge areas for research. Yeah. So here's another one that really gets into the um, physical heterogeneity of the mm. surface. And uh, this is from Carrie Anderson. What tools are there to incorporate the soil physical heterogeneity in reactive transport models? Mm -hmm. Is this usually done through differences in hydraulic conductivity, for example? Are there ways to represent uh, anaerobic microsites? which could have affect pore scale versus bulk reaction dynamics? Yes, excellent question. So um, yes, there are a lot of different approaches for representing heterogeneity. Um, and I think you're correct that permeability is usually the primary um, property of the porous medium that is represented in a heterogeneous manner. So there are a lot of ge geostatistical techniques that are the most common. If you look at stochastic models, uh, re reactive transport models, we can generate alternative simulations that represent the potential structure of the porous medium using spatial statistics method or geostatistics methods. And there's been a lot of research in that area. In fact, that's also sort of dear to my heart because that was kind of my thesis dissertation uh, topic of study was how to represent geologic heterogeneity in these systems. There's also, of course, chemical heterogeneity. And so looking at the different uh, reaction rates and how they vary in space is also very important. And um, one way we can start to look at these things is by combining pore scale models with larger scale models. And 
And so as we look at the details of what's happening at the pore scale, we can gain understanding that helps us better parameterize the heterogeneous system at larger scales, properly accounting for pore scale heterogeneity. Because you're absolutely right. I mean, these, these microsites can be critically important to the, the performance of the system as a whole, but they're very difficult to represent explicitly. So uh, again, the, the integration of pore scale and, and continuum scale reactive transport models is a really important area of research. Yeah, that's really exciting. And I know you've been tremendously active in that area yeah. as well. And yeah. uh, maybe that's next year's summer school. <laughs> it, it might be. Hopefully by then, yeah, we'll we'll have made some significant advances in our in our EMSL multi-scale modeling capabilities. Absolutely. So yeah, that would be a fun topic. So there there are a ton more questions, Tim. I think you're gonna have um, some <laughs> catching up to do on Discord. Uh, but I think okay. we need to move on to our next speaker so that we we don't um, you know, run out of time at the end of the day. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Oh, Tim, thank you. It was such a, a great presentation. So next up, uh, we have um, a reactive modeling uh, tutorial session by Kiwi Chen and Young Saab Song. And so if they're ready to take it away. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Well, I will share my... So can you see my screen? I can see your screen, but it is not in presentation mode. And okay, I'm yeah. hoping that will work. Perfect. OK, so I'll start now. Yep. So welcome to the React Transport Modeling Tutorial session. Uh, my name is Ko Wei Chen. I'm a postdoc at PNL. Today, I'm going to show you how to build a reactive transport model in PFLOTRAN using the biogeochemical reaction network that is developed from the Lambda theory. I consider myself as a hydrologist, so my uh, tutorial will be most from the perspective of hydrologist. There are two uh, major components in this part, in this like uh, tutorial. Uh, things like it's a big jump from the micro, uh, micro scale to the rich scale. I will uh, first give a brief introduction to, for PFLOTRA. I assume like most of you are biologists, probably you don't know what is PFLOTRA and what kind of problems PFLOTRA can deal with. So I will first uh, give a brief introduction to uh, PFLOTRA and then I will like uh, work you through the setting of reactive trust model in PFLOTRAN. So what is PFLOTRAN? So PFLOTRAN is a massively parallel reactive transport, transport model for describing subsurface process. P here means parallel. Uh, parallel uh, 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 is the most important feature of PFLOTRAN because it can be used for uh, large scale model simulation and flow uh, simply means groundwater flow and the term means transport including both energy and mass transport transport uh, there are multiple process uh, implemented in pflow train for example single phase variably saturated ground flow or multi phase flow multi phase here means gas phase and aqueous phase uh, for example the air and water flow in the porous media these two like processes can be simulated independently or like uh, combined with other processes such as multi-component transport or heat transfer. Uh, this figure showing the geological structure for a repository for our uh, uh, for uh, nuclear waste, and this color bar uh, represents the concentration of radioisotope of iodine. Uh, so PFLO train can be used for the uh, chem, uh, for the non-term simulation of chemical trans transformation, especially for a large domain. So with those like process implemented in PFLOTRAN, it can be used for many applications. Here I list uh, some of the applications. For example, it can be used to simulate the CO2 sequestration, uh, CO2 storage, also for the geothermal systems, calculating groundwater uh, H, and it can also be like used for simulating the permafrost like modeling. So permafrost modeling means PFLOTRAN can simulate the uh, phase change 
among like uh, water, uh, vapor, and S. And it can also be used to simulate the redox reactions within hyperexomes or remediation. So if you are interested in one of those like uh, uh, applications, you can go to the Pflotran official website, uh, uh, pflotran.org, or you can just uh, search in the literature. Next, I'm going to show you some cases we conducted at our study site using Pflotran. The first case is rich scale flow and heat transport model. Uh, figure on the left showing the model domain. As we can see, this is a pretty uh, big uh, model. Uh, this model is 60 uh, kilometer by 60 kilometer, and the vertical is uh, vertical like distance is 100 meters. And the uh, figure below showing the like geological structures for this domain. Uh, we use PFLOW train to run the flow and heat transport over the large domain. And uh, this like simulation is run uh, using like about like 2000 cores uh, <coughs> for a few days. So yeah, if we don't have the parallel computing capability, we cannot like uh, uh, run a model like uh, in uh, such like a uh, large domain. And the animation on the right showing the uh, dynamic change of river tracer, which is showing here, yeah, by the like uh, yellow color, and also the temperature change over time, which is shown on the right, and the moving, uh, the moving like blue line showing the like dynamic change of the water level, and the red uh, line is showing the like the temperature. Uh, this is like another case. So we also use PFLOW trend to simulate the flow heat and salute transport at river cradle. The schematic diagram on the left showing the river cradle. So for the river cradle model, we are interested in the hydrologic exchange flow between the river water and the groundwater. And the animation on the right showing the uh, dynamic change of the river tracer, we can see the river tracer moving into the domain uh, when the like water level is at high, high stage and it coming out of the domain when the uh, river uh, stage is low like uh, at the low uh, uh, elevation and this is like a third case we can also use pflow trend to do like reactive transport modeling for color experiments this color experiment is conducted by our collaborators. It look into the uh, reactions occurring in the natural reduced zone in groundwater systems. So here I list a few like main kinetic reactions that is considered in this color experiment. For example, the dissolution of solid organic carbon and the aerobic respiration, and also the sulfur reduction and the precipitation of like element sulfur and the animation on the right showing the concentration change of some typical species during the color experiments. So the oxygen coming to the column on the like uh, from the like left, and that uh, this like uh, simulation like reach like uh, steady state about like ten days after that, uh, we can see the concentration does not change that much. So uh, uh, we've seen like PFLOW trend can do a lot of uh, things. So why we choose like PFLOW trend? Yeah, at least like a few of advantages of you like PFLOW trend. First of all, it's open source. And the most important, it has like demonstrated performers on supercomputers. The plot on the right showing the like uh, scalability of the PFLOW trend, we can see the computation time like decrease almost linearly with the increase of uh, number of cores. And also PFLOW has like active support from like many sources. Uh, there is like uh, well document online documentation and you can also like uh, check the, like the source code. It is updated like frequently. And if you have like any questions, you can just like send email to the Google group or you can post your questions there. 
So I have like uh, talk a lot about like flow, heat, and reactive transport. Here I will like uh, give you like a basic idea of what how like those processes are represented in the subsurface. So the this figure showing the like the conception model for the porous medium. Rows like uh, yellow circles represents the grids or matrix, which is composed by like many minerals, and the uh, uh, blue uh, um, color means uh, the power space, and the magenta represents the pool of uh, water flow. As we can see, the water can only flow uh, within the pore, within the pore, and Actually, it's very difficult to calculate the velocity and the post scale as like Tim just show you. And so here, like uh, we uh, use uh, the things here, like we are like uh, folks on the like field scale like simulation. We use uh, empirical law to name like Darcy's law to uh, calculate the average uh, flow velocity across the domain. So here V means uh, Darcy's uh, Darcy velocity, and K means like uh, permeability. Permeability is a property of the like the matrix. Uh, it uh, represents the capability of the like matrix to allow fluid to flow through. And the mu is uh, viscosity. It is a property of the fluid. And delta P is the pressure like gradient. Uh, Darcy's rule tells us the fluid uh, will flow from the uh, uh, so a high like, uh, pressure to the low pressure uh, uh, location. And uh, for the heat transport, the conception model of heat transport is kind of similar to uh, that of uh, groundwater flow. Uh, the difference is heat can uh, conduct through the matrix. So we use the advection dispersion equation to describe the heat transport in the uh, process media. T here means like temperature and alpha is thermal diffusivity, and larger alpha represents like a stronger like dispersion, and V is Darcy, uh, Darcy like uh, velocities, larger like V like means like a stronger like advection. And for the reactive transport, like it means the like solute transport with reactions. As we can see, the uh, equation for like reactive transport is kind of like similar to that for the heat transport. Like C here means like the species concentration. Like, uh, one difference uh, is we had one more term like I and the N. It represents the uh, consumption or production of the species. If the I is positive, it means the chemicals is like consumed during the transport. If it's negative, it means it's uh, produced during the transport. So here I'm trying to put all like this uh, governing equation for this like process as simple as I can, but for people who try, in people who try, uh, the mm, gamma equation is like much like uh, complicated. If you're interested in how like all those processes are implemented in people who try, you can go to the uh, people who try online documentation. So with those like uh, basic concepts in your mind, next I will like uh, show you how to set up a uh, model in pflowtron. So for pflowtron, the model is configured through ask to file. So ask, uh, so we call that as to as the input deck. This is a convention, and uh, input deck is defined using keywords. Uh, this is an example. The capital like simulation and n. This is keywords in pflowtron. So uh, in this like simulation like block, we can specify we, uh, what kind of a process we want to simulate. For example, if we want to like simulate the, the like variably saturated flow, we can uh, specify that the mode is a Richards. It will use a Richards to uh, describe the flow process. And if we also like want to simulate the heat transport, we can specify the mode as like TH. T here means like thermal, H means hydrologic. Uh, if we want also add the transport uh, process uh, into the flow, yeah, we can add like one more block, uh, which is the subsurface transport. And the global implicit is a way of people trying to solve in those uh, nonlinear equations. Uh, there are like other options such as like operator stability to solve those like transport equation. 
So once we specify the process we want to simulate in pflowtran, next we need to tell pflowtran what is the model domain, what is the property, and how long we want to like, sim uh, do the simulation, and what is capture information. So the keyword like uh, subsurface, uh, uh, this block of subsurface include like the all those information. So I will uh, walk you through all those like keywords one by one. First is grid. So the keyword grid uh, the is like in people trying like uh, it tell people trying like what the model domain is. So within the like grid block, you can like specify there are like uh, other options for the keywords. For example, you can you can like see like uh, the type is structure, uh, which means the gray cell in people trying you said is like is cubic. And then the n, x, y, z uh, means the number of like rates in each direction. Here like 16, 16, 16 means there are like 16 grid numbers in each direction. And the, bound, the keyword like bounds represents the boundary in each direction. So in p the default uh, unit is a meter. So here it means like in x direction, the boundary is uh, at like uh, zero meter and uh, 60 meter. And the same boundary applied in other directions. So for the yeah, the material property, we can like specify like the the information such as like the porosity permeability. But today I'm, I will not like go through uh, that because we were trying to we're trying to make the uh, like flow model like as simple as possible. We will focus more on the like chemistry like power. So uh, for the like keyword time, we can specify the how long we want to do the simulation. Uh, the final time like uh, is a keyword like to specify that. So here like ten means uh, ten like y means ten years, and we can also like specify the initial time step and uh, also like the maximum time step. So the time step in future like it's like uh, it's not constant. It uh, dynamically change according to the convergence uh, while like solving the number equations. Uh, so the chemistry, like the keyword. So uh, within the chemistry keyword, we need to specify a lot of like uh, information that is related to the uh, the to the like reactive transport. Here, like I show the, uh, I use the like uh, calcite like dissolution as an example. So within the chemistry block, we need to specify like uh, other information with different like, keywords. For example, the primary species. This uh, keyword like uh, is asking you to specify those species that can be calculated independently, like within like by like people trend and also in the like block of like uh, secondary species. Uh, those species can be calculated uh, using the like uh, concentration value of the primary species. Uh, according to the uh, equilibrium constant, because like those like reactions uh, run like very fast, and also like we can specify the gases species CO two gas, and the minerals is calcite, and the keyword like mineral kinetics, uh, we need to specify the calcite there, and we also need to provide the rate constant for the mineral dilution precipitation, and the uh, keyword like database, we need to provide the database, uh, the, we need to provide the path for the database. So pflowtron um, uh, had like a complete uh, database there. Uh, it's named like handful.dat. So it has like uh, many like uh, commonly seen like uh, minerals, uh, Defined like in that like a database file, it also like contains some like uh, commonly seen primary species, secondary species, gases species, and also those like equilibrium constants for those minerals. If you have uh, some, you have like uh, new like minerals, you can modify the database to add that into pflow trap. So pflow trap can also be 
kind of like supports like monotype kinetics for micromediated reactions. So this is the monotype like uh, reaction kinetics shown below. So we can add as many like monitors as we want, and we can also add the inhibition terms at the end. However, if we have like a uh, new kinetics developed, for example, uh, the kinetics that is developed from the lambda series, yeah, it uses like exponential terms. This is not included in the generic p filtran. So in this case, we have to modify the source code through sandbox module p filtran. So uh, sandbox is another like feature of p filtran. It allows like users to implement their own kinetics. Uh, into p flow track. And once you implement your like, kinetics there, it is integrated with other process such as flow heat transport uh, automatically. So after that, after we specify the chemistry information, we need to specify like the initial condition in p flow track. Uh, so with in the initial condition, we need to tell people to try the species concentration the con yeah, for each species uh, at the initial state. And for the like boundary condition, the setting is similar to the initial condition. So the boundary condition means the species that uh, the species concentration that come into the domain. So yeah, the format is similar to that. Uh, for, to the initial condition, I will not like, repeat it here. So this is the concept model we will uh, work with uh, today. It's a one D river water infiltration model. Uh, so in this, like the plot, the figure on the top showing the dynamic change of like water level. We can see it, the water level is at. Uh, high like stage in the summer and in the low stage in the winter, and the below is uh, uh, infiltration. This is a like conception model for the river water inf infiltration. The blue region represents the river water, and the yellow region represents the sediments. So uh, the groundwater is flowing uh, in the sediments. The flow direction actually, so in the real world, the flow direction depends on the um, pressure difference between the groundwater and the river stage. So if the uh, river stage is at the low elevation, so the groundwater, is at, uh, the hydraulic head for groundwater is high, probably the groundwater uh, will flow in, uh, upward. So if the River water is at high elevation, uh, the groundwater uh, will like flow like downward. So, so if, uh, in our like tutorial, we are trying to simplify our prob uh, problems. We will not consider the dynamic change of uh, uh, river stage. We assume that the flow velocity is in downward direction and the value is constant. It, so it, uh, which means we will not consider the impact of uh, river stage to the flow direction. And also we will like, we assume the species, con species concentration in the river and in the sediments are constant and homogeneous. Uh, homogeneous means the con species concentration does not vary over space. So uh, this is this is like a general like biochemical reaction equation uh, that we will like consider we will like simulate today, and in the like um, the below is uh, uh, this table showing the stoichiometry uh, for like each species uh, for different like uh, organic carbon. This like uh, um, table is derived from the lambda theory. Him like just show you on uh, the like uh, day two. So before I move into the like uh, tutorial session, I will like let him to briefly uh, go over the lambda theory again. Uh, 
so that we can continue from uh, uh, where he left. Thanks, Kowei. I have uh, only one slide, and because the Kowei okay. will be using uh, the output of lambda theory as an input to his reactive transport modeling using pupillo trend. So as I uh, explained this figure yesterday, here uh, the number of compounds in the uh, FTICL sample is too many. So for Altahama uh, sample, it's a 10,000 samples that has uh, chemical formulas assigned. And therefore, one strategy we used is that we just, uh, uh, based on their cumulative distribution, this orange line there, uh, top left, and then exception lambda, and then we divide this uh, lambda into a discrete number of beans. So for example, we discrete them into 10 beans. Each bean contains like similar, the compounds that have similar thermodynamic properties, lambda values. And the bean one to bean 10, they are characterized by different lambda values. So what we did here is that from each lambda bean, we derived the average chemical formula. So every number of carbon, hydrogen, and so forth. And then use that these 10 uh, representative chemical formulas uh, as, as the group, as a metabolite that represents each lambda bean. And then uh, bottom left, the, you can see that how they are located in the van Cleveland uh, plot. And then also I compare that uh, how lambda, average lambda value from each bean can be compared from the lambda value derived from average chemical formula. So they are, they are very, very similar, uh, indicating that really this classification and then using uh, lambda, the chem, average chemical formula uh, really reasonably well represent real chemical uh, thermodynamic properties of each uh, compounds in each lambda bin. Okay, that's it. Okay. Away. Oh, yeah. So uh, I will start from there. So this uh, screenshot is the uh, uh, narrative uh, uh, that like uh, him they show you on day two, and how to like develop the model using lambda theory. So after you run the uh, tutorial, you will generate those, uh, you will generate those like FBA model, which is named like being average stoichiometry oxygen. So first we will, we need to download those like reactions, uh, they are like uh, four options. You can download the like different format. Here, like we will uh, use like TSV format uh, for demonstration. So T means like tab, uh, TSV means tab separated like values. So once you download this file, uh, you unzip it. There are like two files included in the in this like. Uh, folder. So one is like uh, in with like compounds and the other is in with like reactions. So for uh, in the like the compounds TSV file, it contains uh, all those compound information. So for example, the first column, it is the ID for like uh, different species. XCPD means the, the is, is, uh, means like the uh, uh, organic carbon and the formula is in the column C as we can see. Yeah, there's like pretty long like formulas for like uh, for DOC. And also like we have like uh, other like species, ammonia, oxygen, the like carbonate, uh, uh, hydrogen, and they are like, uh, so in this data set, there are like 10 uh, reaction equations and also like uh, 10 like uh, uh, organic carbons. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, the charge. Yeah, I think we also need the, like, the information of the charge. So uh, here, like the force DOC is like no charge, and, but for ammonia, like is like uh, charge is positive one, and for the uh, like carbonate is negative, and hydrogen like is like one. For like other columns, we don't need that information. And this is like another file, the reaction TSV. So in this file, it contains all those like reaction equations 
for H dissolved organic carbon. So the first column, like A, it is an ID. Uh, it uh, for it is an ID for like H dissolved organic carbon. So and in the like color of definition, uh, it shows a stocky arbitrary uh, associated with the um, with, uh, associated with the, like the the name of the compound. So it does not show you like explicitly what the like species is. So you need to refer to the other file, the compound file, to get the like species name. So um, here, like I will like uh, show you how to set up the t flowchart model in Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is an like, uh, open source web application that allows you to create and share documents that contain like live code equations and visualization narrative text. This screenshot showing the, like, the interface of Anaconda. Anaconda is like a platform that like, combines like, a few like, uh, popular applications for data science. Uh, yeah, here we can see that like two like Jupyter. Yeah, one is Jupyter Notebook and one is Jupyter Lab. So actually the function of these two are similar. Jupyter Lab is like an advanced version of Jupyter Notebook. It is like more interactive, uh, it's still, like more integrated uh, developing environment. Um, but like, it's, like some of the functions that develop here is not supported by the Jupyter Lab yet. So today I'm going to walk you through the uh, workflow using the Jupyter Notebook. So after yeah, you open the Anaconda, yeah, you click the launch, you will like see the you will like see the like the directory for uh, I prepare for you. So so here like we can see there are like uh, three folders and one uh, tutorial IPy notebook. So the data folder like it uh, contains all those like data I downloaded uh, from the um, from the like the KBase narrative. It has the, the reactions in TS in TSV format, and the folder like pflowchain it contains all those like uh, pflowchain simulation related files, and the folder source it can, uh, it has some. Uh, scripts that I wrote for those like uh, tutorial. So yeah, this is a screenshot for the um, notebook. Yeah, we can see there are, like a few. I uh, yeah, in the like top on the top is like menu bar. It has multiple functions. Uh, for example, in the file that like, you can save or uh, create a new notebook, or you can edit. Uh, you can or you can edit view. <laughs> And you can like uh, explore those like functions yourself later. And in the middle is the narrative text. So yeah, as you can see, yeah, this is kind of similar to the K-based narrative. You can write uh, whatever you want in the uh, in the like uh, in the notebook in the Markdown format, and you can also like insert like a link, an image, and equations. And the below is a code cell. So the code cell you can uh, like di directly like run like uh, the code. So notebook kind of like supports like Python or R. So all those code I uh, wrote for this like tutorial is written in Python. Uh, as you can see here, like uh, in the first cell, you need to like import like those packages that is needed by the tutorial. Okay, so next I'm going to show you how to run the notebook. So this is the virtual machine. I will start from the, oh, let me, I think I'd better like start from the, yeah, this is like K-based narrative. Him like just show you like on day two. So after you like go through uh, the narrative, you will create those like uh, objects. So today I will use like this dev set for uh, demonstration. As you can see here, the being average is document of oxygen. If you click here, you will see. 
yeah, we can download the Slack dataset. And we choose TSV. Yeah, it takes some time to uh, download. Yeah, I can. Think, I think I can just skip this. I will. I can show you what is the file is in the virtual box. So after like we download that dataset in TSV format, we need to put that in the data folder. Here, yeah, this is a data, uh, data set that's downloaded from the Kips narrative. If we, yeah, here, like we can see this, uh, this is a compounds uh, TSV file. Yeah, we can open it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is what I've shown you in the slides. It contains all those compound information. Uh, the ID is used in the like uh, reaction equation, and we can use uh, this like table to get the formula for each like compound. And. This is another file, the reaction TSV. Yeah, for each uh, organ, this organ carbon, it has like equations listed here. So in this data set, there are like total, uh, total like 10 reaction uh, equations correspond to like each organ carbon. So once we like put the uh, the downloaded like data set in the in the like folder data, oh, let me close the notebook. Start from the beginning. So to launch, so to launch the anaconda in. Yeah, uh, so the virtual, uh, the in the virtual box, I like, uh, install the like, uh, Ubuntu like systems to launch the Anaconda. We first we need to open the terminal and type in Anaconda Navigator. Here, this is the interface of Anaconda. To launch, launch the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can stop me anytime. So yeah, I put all those uh, files in the folder PNL Summer School of People Training. Here.
Okay, it takes some time to load the notebook. Okay, I will skip the introduction part because I have talked about that in the slides. So like uh, all those like uh, sales you need to run. Yeah, those like sales start like, uh, uh, start like, okay. All those sales start like with in, it means this is like code sale. You need to run it before you move on to next uh, sale. So in this cell, like we basically import all those like packages that is needed in this like uh, tutorial. And the first step is to extract the biochemical reactions from TSV file. So here we need to specify the directory for this data for this dataset. Here it's like uh, this data set is in the directory of that data. And we also need to specify the pflow trial -like simulation directory and the compound file name, the reaction file name. And uh, I write a parser to extract all those stocking geometry and the specific information from those TFC files. And the extracted stock geometry information will be saved in this file the RxNX doc in CSV. So we also need to tell uh, how many reactions we uh, included. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just missed Wait, something. Quay, there was a question as to whether the link to the Jupyter Notebook would be available um, later. Uh, I I think so. Yeah, because like the virtual box size is like uh, per big is 10 gigabyte. So I put sure. that, yeah, I think we can like distribute the, uh, all those like, uh, all those like files to, uh, to the like participants later, yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yeah, after like we run the second cell, we will generate the stock geometry file. Uh, I can show you what the file looks like. Yeah, this is file. That is. Uh, the, yeah, I, I think uh, I can like uh, send you the link after the tutorial session. Yeah, because it, like it takes a long time like to download all those things. Probably you can like uh, do it like right now. So here is like the stock geometry information that is extracted uh, from like the TS3 file. So yeah, uh, the first column is just like, I gave a name for each reaction is R1, R22, R10, and the stock geometry for like each species. So so for the DOC things like the DOC, the the formula like is pretty long as you uh, seen like previously. So here I just use the DOC one, two, three to represent like each DOC. Uh, that is like uh, in, uh, that is like included in each like reactions. So once we have this file, 
next, which is probably the most important step. So next, as I told you like uh, before, so the uh, kinetics like uh, that's derived from the number theory that is in it is not like uh, implemented in like generic p flow chart. So first we need to like uh, modify the source code and to implement that kinetics by by our like selves. So for the step we need to provide first we need to provide like the uh, like a uh, file name. Yeah, here I name it like reaction sandbox PNL cyber. This is the photo file, it's an F19. And we also need to provide the stocky arbitrary uh, information, which is uh, obtained from like the first step. And we also need to uh, provide those variables that are uh, uh, considered in the kinetics uh, derived from like the uh, uh, lambda theory and also provide the like, units for each uh, uh, for each like uh, variables uh, after the after that we can like run these like functions to generate a full transfer source code that can be compiled uh, by like before trend uh, yeah also like uh, things like uh, all those like uh, uh, for transfer code is uh, printed out at the streams using the Python code. Probably there are some like format issue. So here I will use, I use another like uh, uh, I, I use another uh, the like uh, FX print file to formulate those for code. Uh, this is another functions. In uh, I have installed like uh, previ uh, before like the. After I install like uh, before the, uh, the like tutorial, and after like we have generated the uh, Fortran like source code and format it, and we can like uh, compile like uh, pflow trend. Yeah, this is a comment that can be like run in terminal. You can see this is just terminal uh, like the uh, bash comment. Yeah, this comment it tells. Uh, Mm, is copy the generated uh, like a sandbox like source file to the uh, people trying like a source directory. So the generated like uh, people trying like uh, for, uh, people like source file is put in the uh, people trying folder and it will be copied to the yeah this is like a uh, source file for the uh, like uh, entire like people trying for for the like people trying it will be copied there. After that, you need to like compile the like, pflow trend. Oh, we need to run this first. Yeah, after you run this seal, yeah, it will like show you, yeah, the file is generated, formatted. So at the beginning of the compiling, it will give you a hint. This is a process of compiling like pflow trend. After pflow trend is compiled like successfully, yeah, it will show you recompile pflow successfully. So what is the like full trend um, file looks like? I will show you. Yeah, here. Yeah, this is like the Fortran like source code that is generated with uh, Python script using all those stoichiometry information and the separate net, uh, and the like uh, kinetic parameters. Yeah, as you can see, yeah, uh, this is a module that's named the React Sample Sample class. And it contains all those like species information. Here, like I use like DOC one to ten to represent the each like uh, species. It did uh, of organic carbon. This is a pretty long file. Yeah, here. Yeah, this is like the variables that is unique to our kin uh, kinetics. We also need to provide this.
Oh. 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 So yeah, the zip file only contains uh, like virtual box. You need to like uh, enter the like virtual box and all those files are there. The board was closed before any attempt to pour it on. Yeah, I'm not sure what's the reason for that. We, I, can, I can come back later after like I work with all those like notebook. Yeah, this bar is to like uh, uh, specify those like parameters. Yeah, and also the name for like each species. Yeah, you don't need to understand all those, uh, all those like Fortran code, because uh, it takes like probably it would take some time to, uh, to learn like the sandbox. You, if you are interested in this, you can go to the uh, PFlowTran like uh, of your uh, website. If you go to the like uh, so uh, yeah here, if you are interested, you can go to the, oh, I can show, show you the, yeah, this is a people who are like a uh, website. The source code is in the bit bar, is like put in the bit bar kit, and it ha also has some instructions on how to like install like PFLOW train. So if you want to know the, uh, how to implement the uh, uh, kinetics in the set through like sandbox, you can go to the source file source folder. Yeah, so here you uh people try like provide the song like uh yeah this is a source code of people trying. They're all in this directory. Here. Yeah, this is the source code. If you go to the reaction, yeah, all those like files start with reaction are related to the like react transport. So yeah, those files that start with reaction sandbox are uh, related to uh, the implementation of sandbox. There are like a few like kinetics already like implemented in PFLOTRAN. Uh, for example, like uh, reactions in COM, CN. And this is like the cybernetic model. And I think if you want to know, you can start from this file. The reaction sandbox example. Yeah, there is a detailed instruction on how to implement your own like uh, kinetics into the P flow chain. So at each Subroutine, there is like the comments uh, that tells you what you need to specify in that like subroutine or module. And, 
and there's also like another like uh, meaning like other uh, sample problems provided with the uh, p flow trend. Uh, for example, if you go to the short course, yeah, there are like many different problems. Uh, yeah, you can like just uh, choose the problem you are interested in. For example, the corporate chain. Yeah, this is the input deck. You can start uh, from there. Seems like the preferred trend can be used for many like applications and many different problems. Yeah, it's very difficult for one to understand all those like process or all those like applications. So you, you can just start with the most problems you are interested in. Yeah, also like there are some like sample problems for one day like how steam, steam injection, like tracer, injection and variable saturated flow. Okay. After we have mm, generated the source code and compile it successfully, we can move on to set up the 1D color model. This schematic diagram shows the model domain. So it's 1D and the origin point it is at the Button and the pot, the positive like the direction is uh, upward. So here, like we are the uh, um, top uh, river. We assume like the river is at the top side and bottom is like groundward side, and the flow direction is from top to bottom. So for the model domain, we need to uh, tell people who try how long the model is and what is the grid dimension because like people try and will calculate uh, um, those like all those information like pressure, temperature and species concentration, like um, based on like those like, uh, based on those like grids. So it will like give you like uh, all those values at center of like each grid. So you run this cell. Uh, yeah, it will ask you to provide the grid dimension in meter. So the default value I said is like uh, 0 0.01 uh, meter for each grid. And the total length um, for the column is like one meter. And next we need to specify the flow velocities. Yeah, the unit for the velocity is meter per hour and the direction is like downward. After we set the flow, set up the flow, next we need to uh, specify the like react transport like uh, condition. First is the initial condition. Um, yeah, we run this seal first, then I will like so here, like, uh, uh, we make some simplifications so to make like the settings kind of similar to what like him like show you in the KBS narrative. Here, like, uh, yeah, there are a few assumptions I want like uh, I need to like uh, talk about first. First, we assume all those like uh, dissolved organic carbon has the same like initial concentrations, and also. Mm, Yeah, and um, and one another thing like, I need to mention is so in people trend, all those like dissolved like species such as dissolved organic carbon and oxygen, that is mobile, so which means it can move with the water flow, but for the biomass, yeah, it's immobile, yeah, which means it can only like be like uh, be produced, or like be uh, consumed or like degrade uh, degrade. degrade. I like the like uh, and like the origin like the, the location. It cannot like move with the uh, water flow. Uh, this is like uh, like a different. Uh, it's kind of different from like what like him like uh, simulating his model. 
and also like yeah the unit also the unit is different so for those like these of like species like the oxygen species uh default like unit is molarity which is like uh, more per liter but for the biomass it's in different like unit it's the more biomass per like cubic meter of bulk bulk is the like volume of the pulse medium you need to be careful for those like units. You can change those like uh, mm, parameters later, like when you like uh, explore the uh, like different like uh, possibility of the model. So next is the boundary condition. Again, we run this cell first. So yeah, as I said, like the uh, biomass is immobile. So here, like we only need to provide the uh, like the feed feeding concentration for like oxygen and dissolved organic carbon. That's enough. So after that is we run this cell. Yeah, this is like the formulation for the uh, rate kinetics that is derived from like the uh, some type of theory. Uh, and we also like uh, consider the stabilitic regulation uh, in while well, I implement those uh, in the like the sandbox like source code. You hear that the like uh, three parameters you need to specify. Uh, the harvest volume in liter, and also the maximum reaction rate per hour, and also the degree in addition rate. I assume like the uh, the default like um, degradation rate is zero. After we specify the uh, kinetics parameters, uh, next we need to set the time. So the default like simulation time is 200 hours. And we can also specify the output time step, which means that the people trial will save the outputs uh, every one hour. So after that, after that, uh, we need to, after we have specified all those like parameters, uh, in the Jupyter notebook, we need to generate a new pfiltra input deck because, like pfiltra is, uh, pfiltra job can only be like uh, run through the like input deck as I shown in the like presentation. So all those like uh, I uh, provide a template for those uh, for those like uh, for the pfiltra input deck, and all those parameters you specify here will be inserted into the uh template and generate a new uh, p filter input deck i can show you that yes yeah this is uh, like the template for the p filter input deck yeah yeah this is a process here we only consider the transport process We make the flow field as simple as possible. So here, we just like assume the flow is constant. We can specify velocity. So here we don't need like those like uh, process modes such as we recharge. Uh, also, yeah. So in the notebook, uh, we only specify the. Um, concentrations for the oxygen and the uh, dissolved organic carbon, but actually there are like the other species. Yeah, that showing like I was showing you like earlier in the like reaction equation, the other species ammonia, like hydrogen bicarbonate. And we assume all the, the all those species are like uh, the concentration of, um, of all the species like are like uh, 
pretty large, which means the reactions will not start, will not be constrained by the um, by those like species. So because we uh, in this tutorial we we'll care about the behavior like of like the oxygen and the dissolved organic carbon. Yeah, this is like the parameters for those uh, subnetic model. So after, yeah, this is a template for the pre-production input deck. And also I provide a template for the Yeah, this is like a provide template for the database, uh, the species name and ion size, the charge. Uh, yeah, uh, you don't need to. So uh, in this stack database, it does not contain like all those dissolved organic carbon. So after you run this cell, it will add all those like dissolved organic carbon into the, uh, temp uh, into the temp template uh, database. So here, like we draw it. If we run it, uh, if we run it, this is like the generated people trying input deck. As we can see, all those like uh, the of organic carbon will be inserted here. And here is uh, values uh, for those like different kind of parameters, K mu BH. And also the, uh, Yeah, the velocity is, is specified here. This is primary species. Yeah, this is like model domain information. So things that we only like uh, uh, do like 1D column model. So in vertical directions. So here we specify the number of grades in the X, Y direction at one, but in the Z direction is 100 because the grid dimension is 0 0.01 and total length is one meter. So the, the number of grids is 100. Yeah, there are many other like keywords. Uh, you, if you're interested, you want to understand pre-production more, you can search those like keywords one by one in Google or in the like people who try like website. But here I just want to like mention all those parameters that need, that you need to specify in the um, notebook. Okay, here, this is the initial condition. Yeah, here. So for all those species, so the initial concentration you specified in the notebook will be inserted here. This is biomass. Yeah, as I told you, yeah, it, uh, the biomass is considered immobile in pre-flotron. And this is like the uh, constraint uh, and the inlet, which is uh, at the top. Uh, the, all those, uh, the physical meaning for those uh, specific concentrations are like the concentrations in the like river water. And the physical meaning for those initial species concentration is like the concentration in the groundwater. We can actually measure those values in the field and both like for surface water and groundwater. And once we have that information, we can uh, apply that in, in the like uh, in flow trend. Okay, that is the end. So after you 
update the PFLOW train input deck and also the database, you can run PFLOW train in notebook here. You can just click in. This window will show you the progress of PFLOW train running. It will take a few minutes to do the simulation. Here, so here, like uh, this time tells you how long the uh, people has like. So it, it means the simulation has been run up to like 2.7 to negative four uh, hour, and the time step is 2.7 uh, to negative four hour. So the total like, simulation time is 200 hours. Let me see how long. Okay, uh, already like 77 hours. Yeah, probably we can like, wait one, two minutes. It can finish soon. Uh, I think I have some demo. Let me see if I have a demo that is there. Okay, yeah, I think I can use a demo. So, so after the uh, after the simulation, like uh, and PFLOW train will put all those outputs in a PFLOW train will like store like all those outputs in uh, in the format of H five. So we can read those like output file and see the here. If you run this cell, we can see here, here are the like uh, species like uh, information. So we can visualize the species we are interested in. For example, the dissolved organic carbon, we can just choose one if you want like choose like multiple species, we press control Yeah, we can, for example, and we we also need to specify the time point. We want to see the distribution of the dissolved organic carbon. For example, at 44 hours, we can I click, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, let me see what this is just for. Yeah, if we, yeah, once we choose the species and also specify the time, we need to run the next cell, plot the spatial distribution. Here we can see. Yeah, this is like uh, showing the like uh, spatial distribution for each DOC. And we can see here the reaction rate for different like species actually varies a lot. So for the like uh, DOC one, it can swim much faster. Uh, this corresponds to the like being one in like his like, uh, at, he show you his like uh, lambda like, uh, in the num uh, lambda like theory like plots. And for the so add like the, the for the, like the uh, organic carbon like five like it, the reaction rate is much smaller it's almost like constant and not consumed and we can also plot the time series for different like species. Mm. 
And let me choose all those. Yeah, we can plot, or we can also like plot the uh, time series at different like location here. Yes. Yeah, the, here is, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, increase at the end. Yeah, sound like a uh, mm, species increase, I think. Uh, Probably, I'm not sure, uh, probably he has idea of uh, why it behaves like this. We can discuss this later in the... So we can like... Uh, Change those settings in the for different like parameters. For example, if we want like uh, add the degradation, so whenever we change the parameters, we need to regenerate the people try input deck. We can see. Yeah, we can see the de degradation like rate is updated. So whenever you make uh, any changes to the notebook for the parameters, you need to uh, run the sale like 3.5 uh, again to generate the new input deck. And you need to rerun the before transmutation. Yes, this is what I have for this tutorial. If you have access to this, uh, you can like uh, uh, do it to your own. And if you are working on like different data set, uh, if you are working on different data set, you need to like place all those uh, download the data set in the data folder and change the name. And, and also you need to like change the reaction, the number of reactions. For this, for this cell, for the second cell, yeah, if you do you are not, do, if you do not know much about like people and samples, I, I suggest you do not like make any changes to, to like this like code cell because yeah, if there's like a, uh, any like a typo uh, uh, in uh, in the like uh, Fortran source code, the people who cannot be compiled successfully, and you cannot like run it. And once the people people is compiled like uh, successfully, you can make any changes to those. You can make any changes to like all those parameters and uh, and then you like run the simulation and realize the result to see how like those like uh, parameters will uh, affect the simulation results. 
but one thing I want to like mention is so if uh yeah for, for some if you feel like vary the like uh so the, the default like parameters that it can work if you uh, vary like parameter like a lot for example if you vary uh the like velocity or the kinetics related parameters like one uh, order of magnitude or few other magnitude it is probably the like uh the people the people trying like simulation cannot converge the time step will like keeps like counting and it will take like forever long to run the uh, p flow train. In that case, you can just click the kernel and interrupt the simulation and start from the beginning. Or you can just uh, uh, choose the restart and run all. Okay, I think uh i think yeah i think yeah that's what i have mm. yeah if you have any questions you can ask me in the hey Quay, thank you so yeah. much that was really impressive um we do have some time for questions here. Unless, was there more of your presentation, Quay? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello. Okay. Hi, I'm still yeah, here. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, uh, I, I didn't hear like. Uh... So uh, did you have more for your presentation, Quay, or is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. It's okay. what I have. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it looks like there was a lot of um, really impressive uh, work um, and really appreciated the demo. I think there was a little bit of confusion um, <clears throat> about whether they should be able to follow along um, with their own. Uh, you know, account on on and, and link to the um, Jupyter notebook uh, yeah, setting yeah. and things like that. But we got we got that straightened out. Um, let's see. Let me go back and see if there are more recent questions. Um, great links to the P flow Tran site and um, how how to get to the reaction sandbox. Uh, um, so, you want to make? Are there? Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. Let, let's just wait and see if there are <clears throat> questions either coming in through Discord or on the chat. I believe um, some of the initial questions were ma mainly about how to access your notebook. Yeah. And. Um, I can send you the link. I think, Ting, uh, do you have the link? Um, yeah, I do have. I do have the link. Is it? You mean to the Dropbox? Yeah, yeah. So I guess what I would say about that is, well, a couple things. I, I'm not sure. Have we completely cleared cleared that for public release or or not? Oh, okay, okay, I understand. Okay. Yeah. So we do have to go through our our clearance process to do public release, but. Um, we can. I think. I think we'll probably be able to release the the Jupyter notebook. The thing is, of course, to run all these things, you'd actually have to have pflowtran and Jupyter installed. Um, so it's it's not a it's not a simple thing to just provide yeah. a couple files. Um, the nice news is that yes. these, these kind of approaches are actually being currently worked on to be built into KBase as apps. So yeah. as you've seen over the course of the week, using KBase is a very um, easy interface to use. Yes. And ultimately now we'll have the process be able to develop the Lambda models from the metabolomics and import them directly into a KBase app that can run pflowtrend. So that's really an exciting development. Um, and as soon as that's available, you know, that'll be something that'll be really easy to use. So people won't have to actually download and run pflowtrend on their own system, which can be a little complicated to do. Um, 
So, uh, um, so there were some questions earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me. There, there were a couple of questions earlier in the presentation. One is, um, how would you upload the geometry into your uh, setup? It looks like you know the the if the geometry weren't a one D column, are there um, more geometry boundary conditions that oh. are okay um, available, or how are those incorporated? Yeah, so yeah, P, uh, actually, P Flutra has like a like, capability for like um, uh, to define like the uh, model that with like either like structure, like uh, boundary or unstructured boundaries. So uh, here, like I just okay. like, consider like 1D model. So, uh, and it's in structure like grid. So we just need to specify the, how many like grids in each direction and the boundaries for each directions. But P Flowtrain can also like mm -hmm. also support for like unstructured like grid. If you are interested. Then... Yeah, there was quite a few questions actually about the grids and you know how you choose the grid resolution, whether you can do variable spaced grids, what kind of grid is it a finite element or um, I believe PFLOTRAN is finite volume if I'm correct, but yeah. So for the like uh, grid dimension things like our problem is like pretty like uh, uh, it's just like small problem, just 1D. So we can like uh, choose like a very small grid dimension. Here I choose like uh, one centimeter, but if the like model domain is pretty like big, for example, I'm showing the like uh, presentation, probably the, the, we need to like increase the grid dimension. It depends on like your like uh, uh, computation and capability. Yeah, if you, uh, Yep. Uh, have like uh like like more like computational like resources you can like choose a small grid dimension and then you can like realize like you have like more information uh uh for like for the model uh, for the like uh spaces in the spaces for or heat transport at the uh, specific like uh, location in your domain if you don't have like the, that uh, much like computation resources probably you can uh increase the grid dimension to yeah, to reduce the simulation time. Yeah, it depends on your like uh, uh, on the model size and also your computation like uh, resources. I think. Mm -hmm. Kuei, can you comment a little bit on um, the benefits of using Jupyter notebooks for setting up simulations like this? And and if you know anything about it, one of the users was asking about. There's apparently a Python interface to PFLOTRAN called PyPFLOTRAN. Um, do you know about that? And if so, do you have any ideas of how that compares to say using it in Jupyter? Yeah, so uh, I think the Jupyter notebook is very good for like demonstration purpose. Uh, just yeah, as you can see it's similar to the um, like K-based narrative. And yeah, I also I know there is like the Pi like P flow trend, but I don't know if the Pi P, uh, P flow trend is uh, uh, it's still like under development. I'm not sure because uh, the people train is like uh, there's a, like like a few like major uh, updates like every year. So when I did develop the notebook like uh, last year, uh, uh, yeah, it, this notebook it works at that time. But after probably like one month, two months, yeah, uh, it cannot work because some functions do not like uh, work. And probably we need to change some settings uh, in in the notebook to make everything like work like uh, properly. Uh, if the Pi P flow train is like uh, keeps like uh, development, I think yeah, that's a good choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only issue is like P flow train is still like on development, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to spend a lot of time to uh, make our like either like Pi P flow train or the Jupyter notebook to uh, reflect all those like changes to people to itself. Okay, great, thanks. Do you know anything <laughs> about the timing or the- Another question- Oh, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, I, I was uh, just gonna say there was another question along that line in terms of 
development of a GUI interface for PFLOTRAN, but it could be these um, Python interfaces and Jupyter Notebook might actually take the place of that? Or do you know, are there still efforts along yeah. a, you know, a different interface? Yeah, I know. Yeah, if, uh, if we like, if we want to develop a GUI for that, probably it, will, it needs a lot of efforts because there are like many, many like uh, mm -hmm. options as you see in the uh, website. They are like... Uh, sure. Yeah, if you want like develop a grid for that, probably it need, it need a lot of time and a lot of effort, many people to work on that problem. Yeah, if you go to the documentation, yeah, you will see there are like many process and in each process, uh, I mean a keyword, in each keyword there are many like sub keyword. So if we want like put yeah. Limbo, yeah. Tim, can you talk a little bit maybe um, if there aren't, um, if, if there's time about the development of PFLOTRAN? Sure, yeah. So, um, so PFLOTRAN was um, developed from uh, a, a PFLOTRAN is a parallel version of a model called FLOTRAN, which was developed at Los Alamos by Peter Lichtner, um, a serial code. And um, in the, let's see, it would have been, I guess, around the late 2000s that um, Glenn Hammond and Peter Lichtner got funding from DOE under the SIDAC program to develop a parallel version, high performance version of, of uh, Flowtran, which is now called P Flowtran for parallel Flowtran, um, and this so parallel Flowtran P Flowtran is is uh, able to run on the DOE's largest supercomputers using efficiently using I think they've run it on as many as hundreds of thousands of processors at the same time, um, and it can also run using uh, GPUs I believe as well. So. Um, there's a number of advantages if you have very large problems, as Kuwait alluded to, if you have a large problem and you want to use a high grid resolution um, and you want to include a lot of complex processes, you can chew up a huge amount of computer time doing that. So um, definitely running on high performance computers is important when you want to run those large, large kinds of problems. And so PFLOTRAN was developed um, under that sor uh, funding source and became an open source code widely used now within uh, the research community, especially in DOE, but also more broadly than that. And um, it continues to be maintained as an open source. I think Glenn is still the primary lead developer. And uh, if you go to their GitHub site and their website, you can get engaged with the community and learn how to use and possibly help contribute to the development of PFLOTRAN. So <clears throat> not seeing, um, I think there, there is more discussion going on on, on the Discord link, but I think um, there seems to be a, a community answering those questions. Tim, what are your thoughts? Should we move on to the next the next talk? Um, Young Young Sub, I think, has another presentation, or should we wait and take a quick break um, and come back um, at eleven? Yeah, I'm wondering if maybe we should just um, take a break and start again at eleven, so that we don't throw off anyone who was planning to come to the 11 o'clock session. Um, I'll, I suppose on the other hand, we might lose part of our audience if we do that. So uh, what do you think, Jan? Are you ready to go now or do you want to wait until 11? Uh, either way is fine. Uh, I can go now if you want. I suppose, what do you think, Nancy? Should we just move ahead with that? I don't see, see any real disadvantage to going ahead. We have 150 people online, so probably best to keep the momentum going. I, and I think it's also will be recorded. So if yeah. there are people that join, we, they can capture it. I think that would be a good idea. I'm also, I'm kind of worried about the hard stop at 1145. I don't want to make sure that we don't, we give, <laughs> we have enough time and uh, time. perhaps we can address questions if we um, finish early, so. Okay. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah, let's let's move ahead then. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Kuei. I really enjoyed your talk. It was so informative. Thank you.
So I stop sharing. So yeah, next we'll have um, Young Yun, um, sorry, uh, discuss machine learning and AI methods for metabolic learning uh, modeling in reactive transport um, models. And I know there's a lot of anticipation for this talk, so I'm really excited. Take it away. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Um, so uh, Tim's talk and also Koi's uh, tutorial session really sets up nicely my talk. And Tim already mentioned that uh, I'll be uh, presenting the use of machine learning technique as a tool for developing reduced auto model to accelerate the computational speed in coupling with reactive transport model. So this figure right there is the, the gives the idea that what I'm going to do and what is my focus in my talk today. So again, uh, this is overview and then highlight a shaded area represented that I'm, this is a area that I'm going to cover in this talk. So I talk about how to utilize the genome skeletal model uh, developed from meta genomes using KBase and then uh, running this model, FBA model, and generate data. And those generate data will be used to, to train machine learning model, in this case, neural net model. This neural net model will be used as reduced order by Jokepler model for the coupling with the reactive transport model for one day column simulation as an example. So I'm not specifically using the people term for that coupling because this is what our COE covered, but I still will be talking about the coupling with 1D column that using the code generated by MATLAB myself. Okay, so I'll start with the motivation why I, I prepared this talk and also give a brief overview and reminder what is the FVA and the FVA. Although I talked about this uh, yesterday, but I'll give a little more detailed perspective on those uh, uh, method. And then uh, talk about the existing ideas using lookup table for coupling with reactive transport model, direct coupling versus indirect coupling. These two methods came from uh, Tim Scheib's group. And then one of them was led by uh, Elin Feng. And then I talk about machine learning techniques for like a new tool for reduced auto modeling. And then I'll give specific examples of how to develop reduced auto model for BGC model, like biogeochemical model, also reactive transport model. So I think this is a grand challenge in uh, subsurface biogeochemical research, as well as like more broadly, like environmental science ecosystem modeling. We want to build a, a molecular level understanding of biogeochemical function. And then here, bottom left is metagenomic data, metatranscriptomic, proteomic, metabolic data, really great source for building molecular level understanding. However, there's a gap. I mean, so the BGC model, like so-called black box model currently used is not really ideal tool to incorporate this. So there is a question mark here, well, even though I know that there are very innovative ideas to incorporate or use this omics data for building a uh, lump to BGC model though, but I still think genome scale metabolic network model is more ideal tool and the more effective tool to incorporate this uh, autonomous data. But the value of uh, meta genome scale network model is more than that actually. We can use them these models to identify new biogeochemical creation that have not been known before, but very critically important. And also we can use this model to design experiments to validate these new findings and predictions. And I think particularly it'll be useful for studying the carbon speciation, because if you know the current status of lump the BGC model, they are really focused on mostly the nitrogen cycle, but the level of resolution for carbon species is very, very simple. So therefore, there's a room uh, potential that this uh, genome scale model or detailed model can contribute to reveal uh, new new reactions and carbon speciation. And equally important, I think, for uh, studying and modeling coupled carbon and nitrogen transformation because the metabolic model con 
combines all elemental species. They are not only carbon and nitrogen, but phosphorus and sulfur and everything through metabolic pathway that these pathways already mass balanced and charge balanced and energy balanced. Therefore, you can look at those pathways and see how energy, those el key elemental compositions are coupled together through metabolic pathways. And, but there's one small problem we have in using this uh, genome scale metabolic network model for reactive transport model. So this is a running FVA one time. It's not just uh, not a matter because it just runs like a second scale. However, if you combine this model with reactive transport model, like large scale, local scale, eventually global scale, this is really a heavy computationally heavy process. Therefore, that's, that's the motivation of this talk. I want to talk about how machine learning technique can be, uh, can be helping reduce computational burden and facilitating this integration. So um, please allow me to use or uh, recycle some of the figures I have used yesterday. I hope you understand at the same time that it's not easy for me to make four talks over three days in a row. I know the team is making several talks as well. Uh, but anyway, this is challenging to me. So, but the reason I recycle this figure is not because of uh, saving time, but because of relevance. I think this is one of the simplest toy networks I can use for explaining different concepts of model without changing much. Anyway, as a reminder, this is toy network. We have uh, extracellular metabolized S substrate and B biomass and P, P product. And then we have intracellular metabolite M1 to M4. And FOVA assumes steady state for entire reactions, entire compounds, like including in intracellular as well as extracellular. And then the bottom there is a mass balance equations for intracellular reaction. And conveniently, we can represent them as a vector n dot r equals zero is a vector uh, matrix representation. And then FVA performs linear programming to maximize, to identify or predict the flux distribution within this network by maximizing biomass production, R5 in this case. But yesterday, Jeneka and Chris and me clarified that any functions, fluxes, or their combination can be chosen as objective function. Uh, so this is just an example. I mean, we can, you can think about different types of objective function, of course. And, but here, in case we want to determine flux distribution, when we maximize biomass production, we have to constrain one of the reaction there. Otherwise, the solution becomes infinite. Therefore, most frequently people constrain optic rate of substrate, R1 in this case. So then linear programming is formulated like this, maximization of biomass, in this case, R5, such that, so we have an equality constraints, NL equals zero, bottom there, and also constraint, inequality constraint, R1 can change from zero to one. One is just an example. Under this constraint, we can solve, solve linear programming problem. I know the solution in this simple case. The, pathway that will optimize or maximize the biomass production will be just along this straight line. This is so R1, R3, R5 should be one and all other fluxes should be zero. This is clear. Now I talk about DFVA, dynamic FVA is a little bit different. First of all, DFVA assumes steady state only for intracellular reactions that is M1 to M4. Still, it accounts for dynamics of extracellular compounds S and biomass B and products P. So the steady state equation for intracellular metabolized N dot R equals zero is still valid. We can use that. But what changes in this case is that upper bound of R1. Still, we, are we want to maximize R5, but R1 is constrained by their kinetics. The upper bound of uptake, of uptake rate is constrained by kinetics and kinetics function of concentration of S in this case. S is in turn a function of a time. Therefore, their upper bounds change in time because environmental condition change, changes. And this linear program is coupled with the ordinary differential equation. So for simplicity, I, I, let's say I'm interested in like simulating consumption of S and production biomass. I'm not interested in predicting production of product P, then I have only two ordinary differential equations, TS over DT 
Here, X represents biomass concentration. And to solve these two ordinary differential equations, I have to know what is R1, what is R5. This R1, R5 are determined from linear programming under given constraint. And of course, given time, even though this upper bound of R1 changes in time, but if, even time, this is fixed. Therefore, in the fixed upper bound of R1 and we can solve linear programming, get the R specific flux vector. What I need is R1 and R5 again, and R1 and R5. Then I insert and uh, plug this value into this equation. Then now I'm ready to solve ordinary differential equations. By solving ordinary differential equations, I can provide like what is the next time concentration of substrate S. And this S will be used to update the, the uh, upper bound of uh, uptake rate here. Then this cycle goes on. This is very simple, but fascinating uh, idea and a well, well established algorithm. So more specifically, if you consider the batch reactor, and then here left hand side, you can see two batch reactors, but it's different time, T and T plus delta T. I indicated their concentration change in time with, by different colors. So from blue to light blue. And then this is the uh, workflow that that you can follow to solve uh, to, to simulation, to simulate the FBA model. Of course, we have to specify what is the initial concentration of a substrate and biomass. Then based on the kinetics, that is the uptake rate of uh, substrate and you can get uptake rate and then use this uptake as a constraint and fit that into LP, link FBA as a constraint and then run FBA to predict growth rate or all other flux, fluxes in, in the network. And this output is input to ordinary differential equations. And then you just repeat cycle until that your batch time reaches the pre-specified pre ending time. So one thing you may notice here is that linear program needs to be performed at every time step, right? That's the source of computational burden because there are many different types of ODE solvers and Euler, uh, simplest Euler explicit model is simple every time we, we integrate one time, but there is an implicit model and then meaning that equations are nonlinear, therefore you have to iteratively simulate until that you have a good convergence every time step and it increases the number of uh, calculation. And therefore this very, not very significantly heavy, but still uh, this is a source of computational burden in performing TFVA for batch simulations. Same for simulating continuous tank reactor. Now I stole a, a figure from uh, Shaibi uh, et al's uh, paper 2009. And then um, as already a uh, team went over this figure, this represent and this is a, a reactive transport model. And these lines represent their computational uh, grid cells. And then as indicated below by different colors and then at different times, it has a, a spatial gradients of substrate and biomass, also temporal gradient because that concentration change across time as well. Therefore, we, we cannot use like a homogeneous assumption in this case. We have to solve equations or we have to get the reaction rates for every single grid cell within this computational domain. So, and a very intuitive way to do this is that we, every at given time, and then we get concentration from every uh, grid cell, and then uh, we get like a fluxes as constraints and give that to FBA as input, FBA runs at linear programming, and then calculate out like reaction fluxes, all the reaction fluxes and some of the reaction fluxes out of FBA is input to solve this reactable transport model. And now computational head burden even more increases. Previously it was homogeneous, so therefore we just need to repeat the LP every time step, but now every grid, every grid cell, it has different concentration, therefore different uh, flux is different flux uh, constraints, right, for FBA. Therefore, the number of LP we need to perform is number of time step times number of grid cells. 
how many grid cells? It depends on the scale of your problem. And, but usually uh, if you have two dimensional problem, uh, one grid, one uh, coordinate like more than 100 grid cell on the axis. But if you handle large scale problem, it grids, the number of grids really large. Therefore, you can imagine how many time, how much time it will, it will take to get like a simulation result. And now, team uh, really, and his team, <laughs> team's team, uh, really uh, developed nice elegant idea how to couple uh, FBA with reactive transport modeling through lookup table. So what is a lookup table? He already mentioned that, but I'll go over it again. So lookup table is like this, uh, this is three dimensional simple representation lookup table without having to run FBA every time step, every single grid, we just run FBA over possible uh, range of input pluses. Then we generate them in advance. And then we make a table and as a store, we store every input fluxes and output reactions as a table. So it's not really two dimensional table, it's a multi-dimensional table, depending on how many fluxes you take as an input. This is an n-dimensional hyper uh, space of table. And now this indirect coupling, then every time step, every single grid, and then you, instead of solving FBA anymore, you go there and then uh, get the flux constraint and search this uh, lookup table C to see uh, where is the uh, reaction, like a biomass uh, growth rate or other production there, where is it? So we can just go, in this case, oh, our flux constraints are here and organic uptake and ammonium and oxygen here, then, oh, this point three is the reaction rate they need, need to have as an input to solve these reactive transport equations. And two years later, and then same team, but led by Lin Peng this time, this time and then uh, they developed an improved algorithm called the direct coupling and they generate lookup table on the fly in this case. So therefore, first they check whether uh, they get flux constraints every single time, every single uh, grid cell, check whether lookup table get the reaction rate they want to get. If answer is yes, okay, they will use that. And then they just, they don't have to perform FOP. However, if lookup table, because lookup table is not made in this case, in the beginning, just it's generated on the fly. Therefore, initially there is no lookup table. So lookup table will progressively build. Therefore, in many, initially at least, or in many cases, uh, the, the reaction rate they are looking for are not available from lookup table. Therefore, they run FBA and then output of FBA will be given as input to reactive transport models. And this result, because this is, was not part of lookup table, we have to save the result and add that result to lookup table. So lookup table initially zero was small, then in progressively increases the size. This is, this is my understanding of their direct coupling FBA and reactive transport modeling. And then when I uh, left the PNN last year, I had a conversation with Tim Shaibi, and then uh, there was consensus between us that uh, about the difficulty of challenging and extending this lookup table approach to more complex problems. And it's very common that one genome scale metabolic network has a couple hundreds of uh, exchange reactions. Why I'm talking about exchange reactions? Because that's the reactions that can be used as input for performing linear programming. So FOB, therefore, let's say, so Two hundred too many. Like let's say we have a genome scale network and then one hundred exchange reactions. Each reaction, each exchange re reaction takes up different elements and carbon and nitrogen sources and the cofactors and so forth. And we discretize each exchange reaction into one hundred degrees. It's, this is not many. One hundred is just just no more. We can increase that ten thousand though. But even with this setting, how many? What is the complex of the lookup table? How many cells exist in the lookup table? Calculation is very simple. 100 to the 100, 10 to the 200 is 200 digits. It's not the number 200, 200 digits. 
one zero zero number of zeros two hundred. Okay, so then in this case, building a full lookup table is painful process or maybe practically infeasible. Also, reading, I mean, accessing a lookup table and reading values, and this is also a really sluggish process and it will hurt all overall simulation speed. So that's why that motivated work and then I really inspired by the team's uh, suggestion then I was looking for opportunity to implement this idea. And recently I did. And then, so instead of a lookup table, then I'm, we can use uh, machine learning in this case, net, um, neural data model. Neural data model has the same input and output as lookup table. Input are uh, like any uptake rate of interest, like organic carbon, ammonium, nitrogen, and oxygen. Output is growth rate in this case for simplification, but we can increase the no nodes, output nodes, the input nodes as necessary. Of course, we have, like we had to run FBA several times to build the lookup table. We have, have to run FBA also several times, many times, to use their output as, as a training data set for this neural network. However, the required amount of FBA running is significantly lesser because it doesn't have to be like equal distance of uh, discretization of exchange flux. We can just randomly sample the FBA solution from parameter space and then use them as training data set. And here are some, uh, in the next few slides, I'll give you some simple backgrounds on neural network model, modeling for those who are not very familiar with the machine learning and neural network model. So neural network model like has structure like this. It has an input layer, output layer, in between hidden layers. And there are some vocabularies you need to be familiar with. Input variables are called features or attributes. And the number of layers are called depths. So deep learning network means that it has a multiple, intra, multiple hidden layers inside. And also there's width, width is number of nodes for each layer. So wide network or deeper network. So this is a term they can use. And very simple uh, mathematical component of uh, machine learning or neural network model. And so there are three components. It's, I think if you understand this correctly, you can make a neural network model yourself. First, linear mapping. So then you you have a variables in input layer, and you take here uh, as indicated by shaded yellow area here, this is a weighted summation of input variables from the previous node. So then the node values in the current node is determined by the uh, weighted summation of the node values in the previous layer. This simple math is just, made, just a weighting factor here of Ws needs to be determined, the parameter to be determined. But this is simple linear mapping doesn't work. It's not really effective for developing accurate neural network models. So we need more. Second component is a bias. Bias simply that additional nodes is called node is called the neurons, by the way. And then you add additional constant term to the uh, this given equation obtained from a linear mapping. So by adding constant. This is not linear equations anymore. It doesn't satisfy superposition principle. Therefore, it's not linear. It's called affine system, though. Anyway, finally, then now it's not a little, little bit uh, went away from linear system, but the primary source for nonlinearity is activation function. There's a component three. So you add here activation function, and then the output here in this case S1. S2, so forth, SK, it's not our final output. Final output should be, it will be obtained to go by going through this activation function. So this is like a binary, disc, for example, uh, classification. So if output is uh, negative, then zero, the final output is zero, and the positive is one, something like that. But most frequently used is the sigmoid function before, but now people have tested the different types of uh, activation function that the for deep learning, many people think that Lilu is a very weird shape. It is uh, piecewise differentiable, not uh, fully differentiable, but this Lilu really powerfully working well for improving the accuracy of the natural model. Okay, with that, uh, this is a real application of neural network now. 
and I used our PNNL SBL team's metagenome data and uh, collected from North and South. This is for demonstration. I'm showing only the results from North. This is a less vegetative area. Using KBase, I developed, so not, when I say I, it's not me. So actually our teams have built less and helped to develop this network. And then I take that uh, network and then ran FVA and not too many, like just thousand times FVA. And, but here, this is an example of, actually this is graphical representation of a lookup table. It's, for simplification, I just chose only two in input fluxes that can be used as constraints. So this is a glucose uptake rate of fluxes. Look at the unit. It's millimole per gram drive per hour. And then ammonium uptake flux, also same unit. And then look at this. They are piecewise like a plane. Uh, it's not really highly nonlinear. It's nonlinear though, but highly non not highly nonlinear. But there are some uh, linearity you can see there. That's why I think machine learning or neural network really working well. So if you really high, highly nonlinear uh, relationship between input and output, so we have to use like all the best network modeling or machine learning technique to accurately predict this relationship. But in this case, it was very easy. I was surprisingly, it was very surprisingly easy to build the neural network model. Anyway, nevertheless, you can see the two different zone here. Here, there you can see, oh, this is light nitrogen limited condition. So when nitrogen concentration is here, then you can see the relationship between glucose uptake and nitrogen uptake biomass is like that, carbon by it is plain. But here, another second zone here is a carbon limited condition, different equation works for uh, describing their relationship. So I'm, I'm a MATLAB guy, I'm, I'm most frequently uh, using MATLAB instead of Python. But in, in my age, it's difficult to switch over to different tool. But once you're familiar with one tool, one, one language, I think if you're young, if you're intelligent, you can be easily switch over to another uh, language, but I'm not. Anyway, so the particularly the GUI was powerfully working well. So NN start is a neural net start and you will have a first uh, main menu. You can choose different application or neural network feeding, data feeding or pattern recognition or clustering what modeling time series data, this is very interesting. So using recursive uh, neural network, for example. And this is actual training of neural network using one hidden layer as 10 nodes, and then an input uh, or glucose uptake and ammonia uptake output was biomass. And this is an error, decreasing error as iteration goes on is number of epochs. You can take this as iteration. And error significantly decreases at first few iterations and then slowly decreasing after that. And then, so we usually divide the data into three groups, like training group, uh, data for training, data for validation. These two groups together are called the training data sets actually. And then also we set aside the different data sets as test data set. This data should not be used anywhere, anytime for training or for determining this uh, network parameters or uh, hyperparameter optimization, so-called. Now you can see the output is really uh, surprisingly accurate because uh, as target is output variables of biomass production from FOBA, and this is a prediction, prediction from neural network model. Of course, it's training data set, therefore it should be accurate. Validation is also accurate, almost one. Test data set is also correlation is perfectly one. And altogether, of course, one. Now I applied this neural network trained from FBA, like sampled FBA data, and then to simulate a batch reactor. And then I considered two cases. One is a carbon limited condition and nitrogen limited condition. And this solid line represents the FBA calculation, rigorous FBA calculation, and the circle is output from neural trained neural network. So this to, to realize carbon limited condition well, with this, uh, I have chosen carbon limited condition concentration based on the, the three-dimensional uh, lookup table I have shown to you in the previous slide. And then I chose that and then see glucose and nitrogen, they are uh, consuming together. And when gluc glucose is depleted, cell could not grow, means that ammonium is not depleted but could not be used anymore because cell cannot grow anymore. This is carbon limited, that's why. 
And nitrogen limited, we start from lower concentration ammonium. Therefore, ammonium is depleted earlier than glucose. Therefore, after that, Interesting is this model still showing that biomass products are checked with that. I, I never pay attention to that. Sorry about that. But interestingly, this is uh, uh, also not only the output from generator, but also from uh, FOBA. But I check with that. Probably others, carbon, nitrogen sources are using for that. Anyway, so now I talk about neural, the use of neural network for reactive transport model. There are three ways actually. One, as a basic as a basic idea, we can replace replace FOBA calculation with neural network. This corresponds to replacement source term reaction rates in reactive transport model. Second, we can replace reactive transport model itself with the neural network meaning the replacement par partial differential equations itself. How we can generate uh, data by simulating reactive transport models and then use those data to train neural network model. So the approach is that we use the neural numerical approach method. I think Tim has like to talk about this, but there are, so the most commonly used method for solving partial differential equations is the method of lines, meaning that we discretize all the derivative, derivative terms into algebraic equations, except only one variable, in this case, time derivative. Therefore, using the method of lines, we can convert partial differential equations that contains derivative, time derivative and special derivative into ordinary, a set of ordinary differential equations by converting special derivative terms into a set of algebraic equations. Therefore, but typically, we use a finite different method, finite volume, finite element, and boundary element. However, we also it is possible to use neural network model because neural network model is an algebraic relationship between input and output. We can just put there and then com to convert. You know, you can derivative take a derivative over uh, derivative with respect to variables for this uh, algebraic equation. You will get like algebraic equations as outcome. Anyway, but I'm not covering this. I'm not, I have not tested this third idea. I'll just focus first two ideas in this talk. And I made a 1D column model. This is not really a rigorous 1D column model like Kawai did, but this is a simple configuration. I considered only two components of glucose and ammonium. And as indicated by color gradient along the axis, there's one dimensional spatial gradient, and then also temporal gradient as well. And then we'll get unreacted glucose and ammonium at the outlet. And then again, the solid line from FBA simulation and in reactive transport model, and the circle neural network model in RTM. And initially, the their concentration of glucose was zero, but as time goes on, and then it builds up the non-zero concentration of glucose, and then ammonium and biomass growing. And then this delta t is of 0.2 hours. I I don't see any errors in between two cases here again. And then the simulation time, ah, I forgot to mention that in the batch simulation, the simulation time was two, more than 200 times faster. But in this, in this 1D column simulation, it was more than 350 times. It depends on how many grids you consider in this model. I will, I, if I mem remember correctly, it's 50 to 100 grids, but if, you, if I consider 1,000 grid size, like, then the difference between FOBA and neural network model in RTM will be significantly more. And now, second idea, whether we can replace reactive model, reactive transport model itself, whether we can replace partial differential equations with neural network model. So for, for this, I need to specify what I'm, I'm going to predict using neural network model. The target variable, I'm going to predict is concentration change in time at the outlet. So temporal change here of a product concentration at the outlet. This is a target variable I wanna predict using neural network model. To determine this temporal change of a product concentration at the outlet, there are several variables we need to specify. In real 1D column experimental system, we have to know what is the inlet concentration of good carbon and nitrogen sources. Second, what are the flow conditions like velocity, and also parameters that are affect velocity and then resonance time. Like 
dispersion coefficient across the permeability the geometry, etc. And but in order to train the model, and I'm not using these uh, parameters there, so except the velocity, or not not velocity at all. So actually, the I I have taken three input parameters, okay, features to train neural network model in this case. There is the inlet concentration glucose, same as this, and inlet concentration ammonium here. But instead of this, a bunch of parameters that affect flow conditions, I have taken the resistance time distribution as a new feature for training the network. So velocity dispersion coefficient, velocity permeability, they will all affect their resistance time distribution. This is like how long the particle, inert particle will reside or stay inside the column, lip, inside 1D column. That's the definition of uh, resonance time distribution. Then this is my simulation of a resonance time distribution is cumulative way. So cumulative time, cumulative resonance time distribution. And then by changing velocity, and this in this case, I have just only two parameters. This question coefficient that changes from zero to two meters square and per hour and Velocity with zero to two meter per hour. This is a really wide range of variables, and then I randomly pick up uh, this variable and then simulate so-called cold flow simulation because there is no reaction. This is enough without reaction. I just simulate just reaction to get this uh, cumulative resistance time distribution. And this is a testing like uh, this is a new data and I never used for training at all. For example, I have chosen sixty-four millimole. A per liter glucose in the feed and then 48, 5.6 millimol per liter for ammonium. And this is specific case of resonance time distribution. Then this is output, a temporal change of concentration uh, as like, like a glucose and ammonium unreacted uh, substrates. Initially, there's no unreacted because there in the in the react uh, one D column there is no ammonium concentration, but as time goes on and it develops certain non uh, non zero uh, profile here, again this solid line is uh, solving rigorous reactive transfer model and then uh, this neural network model. This is cool. I don't see any errors uh, out of this either. However, I have to confess that I used a trick in doing this. Actually, I'm, I have not used one giant, one master neural network for fitting or predicting this. Actually, I had to use sub neural networks for each time zone. So for example, the two predict response uh, at the outlet from this first time zone, I had to develop first sub neural network, second neural network, and third neural network, and then I combine them. Well, that, that is not really cool, but I found that in recent paper, this composite reduced order modeling approach is not really rare. It's common or it's becoming available. So for example, this paper, Chen et al. in 2020 paper, they also used like machine learning techniques, multivariate uh, analysis models for, uh, for reduced order modeling. This is a carbon CO2 uh, injection rate for CO2 sequestration. And X axis is real data and Y axis is their uh, reduced order model prediction. But this is the result when they use one uh, reduced order model. But if you look at the right hand side, it's a log log scale. There is data is dispersed. When this uh, range of uh, CO2 injection rate is small, this is strikingly similar to my situation. So therefore, what they did is that they divided this injection CO2 rate into subdivision and developed four different sub-reduced order models and finally combined them like that. So they called it, this is a Frankenstein's Ramster model. Ram represent reduced order modeling, similar to like a Frankenstein's monster Ramster. It's fun. All right, so this is summary slide, and I talked about machine learning for more scalable BGC and reactive transport modeling. And then I, I showed how I can build a reactive transport the, the neural network model based on FBA simulation and the, to replace the reaction rate terms in reactive transport model. Or even I can replace the people, the, not people, the reactive transport model itself based on uh, reaction, based on boundary conditions 
and then also residence time distribution to predict the outputs. Or in this case, I, I think I have to use a set of sub reduced order models, but in the future, I'm going to test what if I test a more deeper neural network, deeper neural network has more, uh, many more internal hidden layers and many more also wider network There's some more nodes per layer. This may, may improve the prediction accuracy. So finally, this is my final slide. And then we previously provide a workflow for incorporating metagenomes and all the way to develop a reactive transport model. The challenging part was here, as, as boxed here, how to link this uh, flux balance analysis to biochemical reaction and reactive transport model. But the work I have presented today is really open a new possibility to enable and seamlessly connect FBA and, uh, and then reactive transport model and biochemical model. This workflow, we name it the magic metagenome map integration into ecosystem models. All right, uh, that's it. Uh, do we have time for questions? Sorry, I'm getting my getting unmuted here. Hyun, that was just wonderful. And there are lots of questions, um, both uh, in Discord, which you might need to address, um, you know, during the break or something. But there were a few questions uh, coming up on the on the chat here, and. Um, Here's a question for generating the training data set for the neural network. It should be required to do this only once for a particular organism or a specific community composition. So can you address that? And then there's more. <laughs> um, it depends on how uh, modelers want to formulate the model. If the modeler wants to develop one supraorganismal network and then uh, I think still, uh, uh, I think compositional information will be helpful to train the network better. I think in either case, I thought initially I thought, okay, the compositional information is important only for we develop species level interactions, but both cases they are useful. But so in this case, I assume that really that we have only one network, but if you want to look at predicted interactions, species interactions, and their, their compositional effect on biochemistry, I think you better add the compositional data as input as well. Okay, that sounds great. And what is the time effort required to um, train the data set? It's surprisingly short. I, so we are currently in the United States that we can use K-base for training um, neural network model. I trained neural network myself on using MATLAB, it was very short, I just uh, minutes. Believe it or not, minutes, but KBS, it was short. June have to test that. Also, it was very short. Okay, and so do you just do that once or do you need to train it multiple times? Is it like a- Good question, but yeah, also I have to modify my answer because it was a short because my case was considering only two inputs and then one output, but if I expand the inputs and outputs, it'll take more. But okay. training is not necessarily the bottleneck. And then multiple, yeah, if the problem is complicated and data uh, complexity increases, sometimes we just train oneself and then followed by fine tuning to do hyper optimization. It's like uh, there are some step-by-step -step approaches for improving uh, accuracy. There were, there were some questions. I mean, every, I think everybody is completely enthral enthralled by this concept, this magic. Uh, concept. And so there are a lot of requests for, you know, literature, um, any references that you might have um, that uh, that you think are key for pursuing this or that you're in the process of developing. Right. So this is a, one of the, our focus manuscript papers we are preparing. Uh, uh, this is not available as a paper yet, but we started uh, outlining paper and then through publication, we'll share everything uh, in, with public users. And But at the moment, just uh, know the concept is available and tools are all required, the competition tools are developed. And then the remaining things that we just put them together as our entire one pipeline and workflow. That'll be coming soon. So, so is there any existing papers that really connect the neural networks either to the, um, the flux 
flux balance analysis or to reactive transport modeling or? Uh, I don't know. Prob I This was very easy. I, I think there might be some work or uh, papers on uh, training a neural network for FOB, but I don't know whether this method has been used for coupling with reactive transport models. Okay. So, so yeah, I mean, this is what's really exciting, uh, you know, about the developments and your willingness to share them, um, you know, in this, this school. It's just so exciting. Um, so here's a question. Uh, how many observations, field and laboratory, will be needed to build a decent model? I know it might uh, depend on the application, but maybe a range. I, I don't know that I completely understand the yeah. context. So I need to clarify whether uh, the question really is about data-driven modeling, like a neural network model or the mechanistic model. But uh, is usually this data-driven modeling or machine learning requires significant amount of data for training. There's a one issue in using uh, machine learning techniques. But one way we can do is that we uh, train mechanistic model first using limited experimental data. But you know that how many data is required for training and not training, determining or uh, developing mechanistic models. And then we run the mechanistic model to generate significantly large number of data. That simulated data can be used for machine learning then. Then mm -hmm. it's an alternative way, but this is uh, uh, worth doing. Well, that's great. Um, I guess we can hang out here, see if there are more uh, questions coming in. Can I ask a quick question, Nancy? I was, I was going to ask. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks. I was going to ask Ken um, about your thoughts on these kind of applications and maybe future apps in KBase. Is there any plans there or any way to connect this to KBase? Yes, uh, that's a good question. We really aimed at demonstrating this pipeline, like machine learning component as well through KBase. But so actually we are currently at a stage that we can uh, generate import data into KBase space narrative and train neural network model using Python library that you uh, installed. And we can, that training process is easily done. However, we have to save the output file in KBase. To save output file, we have to define objects. It's objects the format of input and output files. We are not allowed to define output file ourselves. Therefore, we have to, because once it is defined, that it, it, it will be used for many other users. Therefore, we have to be, have a, enough discussion with the KBase team. I think with that, with overcoming those barriers, then I think that it will be soon available for implementation in KBase as well. Ken, here's a, another question, which is really kind of interesting um, uh, from Allison Toon. I'm thinking, if I'm thinking of this correctly, neural networks aren't solving a set of physical conservation equations necessarily. So are neural network models conservative with respect to mass or energy? Or does careful training of the neural network take care of that? Uh, yeah, that is an interesting question, really. And Mechanistic model really uh, guarantee, I mean, good Mechanistic model guarantee that mass and energy are balanced out. However, this is approximation. This is data-driven fitting and uh, tuning. Therefore, not rigorously satisfied, but it's reasonably well satisfied if we develop well this neural network model. So is this just different than like um, physics constrained uh, machine learning or, you know, uh, chemistry informed or does it, yeah, sorry. Uh, I think physical constraints can be, I, I'm not very familiar with that concept. Um, so what, so everything should be accounted, I think, as input at the feature and then target. Right. Therefore, uh, we can account for physical constraint through features and then uh, output variable. Therefore, uh, indirectly, we can account for that. But still, uh, rigorous uh, 
mass balances may not be uh, observed from this data, but error might be small though if we develop good models reasonably well. But it's, there's a so there's a, a lot of way to synergistic, synergistically combine mechanistic models and the data driven modeling in that sense. Tim, did you have anything you wanted to add or reminders? Uh, no, just that um, we we do have an extended lunch break today. Um, unfortunately, we have a conflict with our Zoom channel, so we have to drop off at 11.45, and we'll be back at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight time. Um, so, you know, we'll have about an hour and 15 minute break, and then we have a couple more great presentations coming up this afternoon and uh, we'll learn some more tools on how to integrate metabolic models with reactive transport. Yeah, that'll be great. I think Roloff uh, Verstig and Rebecca Rubenstein will give you a presentation and then we have a, an R demonstration from Michelle Newcomer uh, this afternoon. Um, Becky did remind me that we might be a few minutes after one by the time we get going again. So um, if you join us, Please, please just wait. We'll, we'll be there shortly. I want to thank um, this morning's speakers, including you, Tim, <laughs> uh, for some really, really great presentations and um, just just wonderful uh, continuation of the school. Uh, Hune, thank, thanks again. Um, I think you're going to be our, our YouTube star <laughs> uh, here. And... Um, with that, uh, should, we, should we just adjourn a few minutes early then? Sounds good. Then we can make sure we don't run into the uh, other meetings problems. So, yep, sounds great. Okay, see everybody shortly after one. All right. Thanks, everybody.